Texas Synergy Field in Cincinnati. It's a cool night, a damp night, but we're ready to play ball. The Mets and Reds to see which team will be the wild card in the National League, which team will be the team of destiny. It's a sellout tonight, and this ballpark, it used to be the home of the Big Red Machine, they once again love their Reds. It's the Reds and the Mets who both had great years. They both won 96 games, and ironically, only one of them will advance to postseason play. On the shores of the Ohio River, scene of many a big ball game, but not so many in the last three years. They haven't had a postseason game here since 1995. But tonight, it feels like October, 48 degrees, the humidity 96%, and the forecast is for a heavy drizzle, and we can tell you that that forecast is accurate because it is drizzling right now, as these fans know all too well. The game last night in Milwaukee that created this game did not start until nearly 10 o'clock Cincinnati time and did not end until after midnight in Cincinnati. Tickets for this game did not go on sale until 7 o'clock this morning, and yet it is all sold out, which is an incredible story all by itself. The lineup cards have been presented at home plate, and here come the Reds, led by their captain, Barry Larkin. Bobby Valentine, the Mets manager who had some vindication over the weekend as his Mets rose from the dead to win three straight but still he has managed more games than any current manager without ever being in postseason play something that this one game can turn around for him and of course his opponent tonight in the other dugout Jack McKeon has also never managed in postseason play here's the Mets batting order Ricky Henderson there was some question but he's in there tonight he left yesterday's game with a calf muscle injury. Edgardo Alfonso second base. John Olderud first base. Mike Piazza with 40 homers. The catcher and Piazza with 124 RBIs tying a career high. Robin Ventura third base. A great year. Darrell Hamilton a big RBI yesterday. Center field. Roger Cedeno right field. Ray Ordonez the shortstop and ally to the pitcher he is batting ninth. And for the Cincinnati Reds it's the 31 year old right hander Steve Paris and this guy really gave them a jolt when he came on Mostly in the second half of the year, Joe, he went 11 and 3 for them. Well, Johnny does it because he has good control, throws a sinking fastball, change up, and he will throw a slider and a cutter. Doesn't throw very many curveballs, but he does have one. But his key is that he usually throws strikes. And let's take a look at the defense for the Reds. I actually think that the Reds rival the Mets defensively. If you look up the middle, you have Barry Larkin and Porky Reese. I mean, they're as good as any pair in baseball. And they also have some speed in the outfield. Hammonds is very good in center field. A big bat of Vaughn in left field and Young in right field. But Porky Reese has made some spectacular plays at second base. And Barry Larkin over at shortstop, he's been doing it for years and years. A lot of gold gloves. So this infield may favor the Reds today instead of the Mets because that's not a normal occurrence. The Mets usually have the best infield on the field but on this AstroTurf the Reds may have a slight advantage. So now Ricky Henderson and certainly when you think of the Mets lineup you think you've got to contain Piazza first and foremost but also it helps in a tight ball game and a big ball game if you keep this guy off the bases and there is ball one. Well he's not as big a stolen base threat as he used to be John but just his presence at first base makes you give Alfonso a lot more fastballs to hit and that center is in there for a cold strike one ball one strike Ricky Henderson had to leave yesterday's ball game in the seventh inning after hitting a single because he had tightness in the calf muscle and he has a base hit to left field Joe you were talking about the infield and how it plays here when it's wet like this and cold and Greg Vaughn told me in the outfield that he's got to or at least he feels like he's got to play deeper because it's tougher to cut balls off in the alley. He's got to play a little deeper to try to create a little more range for himself out there. And that's an interesting way of looking at it, John. The deeper you play on AstroTurf actually the less 
ground you cover when it's wet because you can't get the angle that you would like to cut the ball off. Because the more you run away from the ball, the faster it gets away from you. Now here is Edgardo Alfonso. Henderson at first base, remember? He had been nursing a hamstring injury, and then he had the, the calf muscle that tightened up yesterday. He does have 37 steals this year and only been caught 14 times. Not bad for a 40 year old. Alfonso showing bunt and taking strike one call. Jack McKeon, the Reds manager, who's been in this game all his adult life. And he says that he thinks it is very important to try and score first in this oh, game. I don't think there is any doubt that you try to break out on top in a tight game because the closer it gets to the end, the more pressure on the guy that's behind, the team that's behind. One ball, one strike to Alfonso. Remember that this game is part of the regular season. So when we give you the statistical rundowns and all of the players, that is still in progress. So far, Alfonso, 26 homers, 105 runs battered in. The Mets have three 100 RBI men. Anderson easily back to the bag at first. Now, Torbenzi, the catcher, I mean, he always used to have the rap that he was not a, a very good thrower. And a lot of teams used to like to run against him. Whether Ricky will be able to run tonight with the leg problems he's had, we'll see. Center field going back in the ball is Hammonds. Still going back. Back to the wall. It's gone. And that one seemed to surprise Hammonds. He started to break back easily on it, thinking he had a play. But he did not. It was over the 404 foot marker. And the Mets have jumped ahead of Paris 2 0 after only two batters. The 27th home run of the year for Alfonso. Well, when he first hit it, I didn't think it was going out either. I knew it was going to be deep, but the ball just carried. He put a lot of underspin on it. He got the carry out of it. And that's a long way straight away center field here in Synergy Field. Well, hey, that crushed that ball the deepest part of the park on a cold night but I still believe that part of the reason he gets so many fastballs is because Ricky Henderson was at first base not John Olerud Sean Casey he'll take it himself Olerud gone on one pitch in the first six pitches of this game the Mets put two runs on the board and that's interesting because the Mets had been struggling to score you know this week I mean, yesterday, Joe, it was just the opposite. And they were scratching and clawing. The pressure was mounting. Now they come into this roiling cauldron of Synergy Field with the huge crowd making lots of noise right away. And immediately, they put two on the board. This ball one to Mike Piazza. 40 homers, 124 batted in. Now, he has been catching every day down the stretch, as you would expect, because he's not just a catcher. He's the key man in the lineup. And uh, he said after the game yesterday, Joe, that his back has been tightening up a little bit and he's not able to drive the ball the way he'd like right now. Two and over the count. Mike Piazza has been the guy for the Mets. He's a stabilizing influence right there in the middle of the lineup. He and Greg Vaughn have carried their ball club. And sinker in there for a strike two and one. Now the Mets had the one advantage they decided last night about a quarter to nine just to go ahead and head to Cincinnati. The game in Milwaukee with the Reds and Brewers had not even started yet. They said, let's get a good night's sleep in Cincinnati just in case. That's too low. And uh, John Franco was telling us before the game that they were uh, in their hotel at maybe 1 o'clock this morning. The Reds, of course, they were not in their homes till maybe 4.30 this morning. That's ball four. So Piazza has walked with one out. Two runs already in. And now another power hitter, Robin Ventura, will come up. Well, I thought that was a smart idea for the Mets to, uh, you know, fly out after the ball game last night instead of waiting till this morning and flying here. But the fact that they moved the game to 7 o'clock tonight, I don't think it really hurts the Reds. The fact that they got home, I think they all were able to get a good night's sleep. And let's face it, this is a one-game playoff. You feel all the adrenaline flowing, and the adrenaline can take over for a tired body at least for one day. Here's Robin Ventura, 32 homers, 119 runs battered in. And that's out of play as the Mets were struggling in that seven-game losing streak, losing eight out of nine eventually before the weekend. 
Ventura was struggling, hitting well below 200, not driving in runs, but he rebounded over the weekend. He had the big hits in a tight victory on Friday. The next inning went over Pittsburgh. Down and in. One ball and one strike. Now, Joe, Steve Paris, as valuable a man as he's been, he gives up the two run homer to Alfonso. I mean, he really did not have the luxury of working himself into this game. Right. A lot of adrenaline's got to be jolting through his body tonight. Well, his the plan is for him right now is forget about the two-run homer and get out of this inning. Because he knows his ball club pretty well, and two runs probably will not beat him. So if he can just hold it to the two runs, he'll still have a good chance to win the ball game. So he does not have a whole lot of big league experience, but he does have a lot of professional experience. Back to Paris. To Larkin one, to first, two. So it starts terribly for Paris, but he rebounds nicely. Now the Reds are coming up. Two nothing. Mets. It's are, and if they'll give him a chance to be a little erratic. And let's take a look at the defense. And the infield has been called the greatest infield in the history of the game, and a lot of people agree with that. Ordonez, Alfonso in the middle of the order, and Robin Ventura and John Olerud on the corner. Alfonso, and between them, they've made nine errors, meaning Ray Ordonez and Edgardo Alfonso. I mean, that is a magnificent double play combination right there. Only nine errors for the entire season. I mean, that'd be a great year just for a shortstop. For one of them, yeah. I mean, it'd be <laughs> an incredible year for a shortstop. Pokey Reese, then Barry Larkin. Two to nothing. The Mets are leading. And it is too high. Now, Leiter started off very poorly, but in the month of June, he won all five of his starts, but has been below 500 since June. Strike call to the inside. One ball, one strike, the count to Pokey Reese. And 3 0. Oh. All right, I beg your pardon. Two and one is the count. John, I don't have a radar gun, but that's 79 and 80 miles an hour is not correct. These guys, both of them, Paris and Lighter, are throwing harder than that. On the count. Too high, three and one. We've got top experts in the field recalibrating. Good. So that we have the accurate depiction on the radar gun. Bokey Reese now with a three and one count. He's hitting 285 for the year. And he eases one over the outside. Strike two, three and two the count. Reese does not often walk, only 34 walks the whole year. But when he gets on, he does not often stay at first base very long. He has 38 steals. He walks. John, that's key for a lot of reasons because it puts Leiter in the same position that Parrish was in when Ricky Henderson was at first base and he ended up giving that Gardo Alfonso a fastball out over the plate that he hit over the center field wall. With Pokey Reese, a base stealing threat at first base, Leiter will have to be conscious of that, and that will help Larkin in the pitch selection that he would get. The stolen base is a big part of the Reds' game, and Pokey Reese is tied for the club lead with 38 steals. And even as we say that, that's another way they miss Mike Cameron. He also has 38 steals. And it's interesting how the Mets hold their runners on. Olerud plays off the bag, not like normal first baseman. And I think that helps a base stealer. Barry Larkin. It is ball one. Bruce Fremming, as he was yesterday at Shea Stadium, is the home plate umpire. We have a six-man umpiring crew assigned by the National League tonight. There's the veteran, Bruce Fremming, who had an excellent day yesterday in New York. One ball and no strikes to count. Olerud back to the bag again. Too low. And lighter. Having a problem. 
Well, this getting is, a feel for the strike zone. This is always a key for lighters. Is he able to throw strikes? And will the other team be patient enough to give him a chance to be a little erratic? And even down 2 nothing, Reds fans are into this one, making the big noise. Piazza went to the mound, and the fans began cheering even louder. 2-0 to Barry Larkin. Larkin hitting 295 for the year. 12 homers, 75 batted in. And that's a strike. On the inside with that cutter. Two balls, one strike. Now, Lighters have problems on the road lately. He has lost each of his last four road starts and has not had a win in any of his last seven starts away from Shea Stadium. Now he goes to first on a two and one count and Reese is back. Well the reason you play off the bag is you're trying to protect the hole. But if you have to move back jockey back and forth when the pitcher throws and you're moving back toward first it really limits your range. Right there Ricky Henderson. Well he got that cutter into the hands of Larkin and Larkin did not hit it very solidly. Good pitch there by Leiter. He started that look like a fastball on the inside part of the plate. Now watch where it starts. Right there and see it cuts in. Larkin almost gets to it. But a good pitch there by Leiter. Now the Reds power comes up. Young Sean Casey. And I remember Joe last year when he first came along. And this is a guy who came out of the Cleveland Indians organization. And 334 average, fourth in the league this year, 25 homers, 99 batted in. His first full year in the big leagues. And Jack McKeon compared him to a young Tony Gwynn at that time. He said, hey, he uses all fields. He's a line drive hitter. But unlike Gwynn, he said, eventually he'll start hitting more homers. And eventually was just a year, year later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and on the count. And you wondered, I mean, Man, is McKeon overstating this? I mean, Gwynn, that's, that's a pretty tough comparison, but that's the way Casey is hit. Well, Casey is hit 277 against left handed pitching, but Leiter started him off with a perfect pitch. Fastball running in. Oh, tough pitch there, too, and it is 0 and 2. Well, see, you run the fastball in, make him conscious of that, and then you go away with a cut fastball. So he went away with this pitch. And he just kind of waves at it. That's the cutter. But the first pitch with the fastball tailing back in, and that was the key pitch. So Casey down the count 0 2. Reese, who walked to start the inning, is still at first. The Mets lead 2 0. 2 high. One ball, two strikes. The right handed batting slugger as Piazza appealed to the third base umpire, Ed Rapuano. And Rapuano denied his appeal. One ball, two strikes. Greg Vaughn on deck with 45 home runs. Sean Casey, a National League All-Star. Led the league in hitting for a couple of for almost two months. And back to the bag is Pokey Reese. Now, Joe, I'm, I'm just guessing. One of the reasons Reese is not trying to do anything is with the left-handed hitter up there keeping the hole open. Well, I, I think it's even a step further than that, John. They want to give Greg Vaughn a clear shot at tying this game if it comes to that. He's your cleanup hitter. You're down two runs. You want to make sure that you give him an opportunity here in the first inning to try to get an at-bat with the tying run at the plate. Two and two. There's Vaughn on deck. Now we're, we're keeping you... Posted on what's going on over their first base because with the Mets there's a lot of action over their first base with the runner on. Well, actually, what happened now is that Olerud is farther off the bag than he was before. He's out on the turf. Well, and you can see there that Reese was flinching back to the bag even as the pitch was going to the plate. But it's okay for Reese to flinch back. But if you watch, Olerud was jumping back. That puts him in poor fielding position if he's moving back toward first base himself. And the pitch is delivered. He's actually cutting down on his range, so you're defeating the purpose of standing out there. Two and two. Sean Casey. Reese at first. Full count now. It was 0 and 2 to Casey. And this is a situation where I think if you're the Reds, you go ahead and send him. Try to stay out of the double play. 
you're taking the risk that a strike out and throw him out but I think in this situation you have to show some aggressiveness you can't just wait back and hope that something happens for you. And over to first Reese is back and if you're the base runner at first base to keep this from bothering you all you're going to do is concentrate on the pitcher. You do not worry about where the first baseman is. You get your normal lead and stay there. You don't worry about what Olerud does at first base. You're just reading the pitcher, getting your jump off the pitcher. He's going. Left field, going back Henderson. To the warning track, he's under it. And he's got it. Reese will have to go back to first. And Reese had a pretty good jump there, John, and I think that's exactly what you do. I think he's learned how to handle what they're doing to him at first base. You just read the pitcher and do not worry about where Oleru is. Now Mike Piazza leaves home plate and uh, the Mets trainer comes out with a, a tongue depressor because he's got some uh, some mud lodging in his spikes. The, the dirt cutouts are uh, are muddy because of the the moisture. It's never really been raining per se but it's been drizzling all through batting practice and right up to game time. Greg Vaughn, he capped off the five run inning against Cal Eldred with this shot in his old ballpark into the empty bleachers out there at County Stadium. Bleachers he's reached many times over the years. Now Vaughn with 45 home runs. Way outside. Now Vaughn has hit a couple of home runs against Leiter. They faced each other many a time. And Vaughn with six hits in 21 at bats, including two home runs. And if you're lighter, if the score is nothing to nothing, you would pitch him a little differently than you would here. You have a two run lead, so you can be a little bit more aggressive with him than maybe you would be in a tie ball game. Oh, the uh, curveball, and Vaughn tried to check. He was fooled on that one. One ball, one strike. Vaughn with the 45 homers after hitting 50 last year, so he has. Impeccable credentials is one of the game's premier power sluggers. That's a hard breaking ball down and in. Two and one. The other thing about Vaughn, Joe, unlike McGuire and Sosa, I mean, his ball clubs have been winning. That's exactly right. He has contributed to the Reds this year and, of course, San Diego last year getting to the World Series. He was the National League Player of the Month in September. And those are the most important home runs down the stretch. And the Reds made an excellent stretch run. As Reese is back to the bag again at first base. I don't think you'll see Reese try to steal in this situation unless Vaughn gets two strikes on him. Then he may take off. But other than that, I think you're going to give Vaughn a chance to swing the bat here in this inning. Another breaking ball. Now it is three and one to Vaughn. Dimitri Young, a switch hitter, is on deck. And Leiter is pitching very carefully to Vaughn, and he should be because, as you mentioned, Vaughn has been swinging the bat very well, and he's the one guy in this lineup that you have to fear on every pitch. Pokey Reese at first, two down, first inning. The Mets lead two nothing. Three and two. Well, what he did there is pretty smart by Leiter. He threw the fastball. It was up, maybe out of the strike zone, and Vaughn went after it, but he wasn't going to give him a fastball. In the middle of the plate or anything they can handle. Now watch this pitch is up. You see Piazza gives him that little signal to get it up, and he does get the fastball up. But don't expect him to come with another fastball. This is a situation where he set it up now. He can go with the cutter or the curveball, something down and in. Bond laid off before he had two strikes. Be tough to lay off with two strikes. Looks like the curveball. There goes Reese, and the curve strike three called. So Leiter labored. He went to a full count on three of the four hitters. But after one, it's 2 nothing Mets. Six, it all gets started tomorrow at 4 o'clock on ESPN. Either the Reds 
for the Astros in Atlanta against the Braves and Greg Maddox. Then on NBC tomorrow night, the Texas Rangers and the New York Yankees at the big ballpark in the Bronx at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, followed by either the Mets or the Astros against the Arizona Diamondbacks at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific time right here on ESPN. So I guess the Astros are still waiting in Houston, huh? To decide what they're going to do. I, I don't know. I mean, because where, where would they go? <laughs> yeah. Wherever they did go could be the wrong place. Here is Daryl Hamilton. One ball and no strikes. Hamilton, big hit yesterday for the Mets. They're driving their first run. It was the only hit in the game that the Mets had with a runner in scoring position. During their losing streak, the Mets hit only 115 with men in scoring position. Second, Pokey Reese. Hamilton is gone, one away. John, I have to go back to the first inning. That was a very good pitching job by Leiter to get Greg Vaughn out after he fell behind because Vaughn was laying off of that breaking ball down and in, and he set him up perfectly with the high fastball three and one, came back with a curveball. That was excellent sequence there by Leiter in a tough situation. Now, Roger Cedeno. Roger Cedeno is second in the league in stolen bases. 66 steals. And that curveball is in there for a call strike. It is on one. The Mets, a very strong offensive club, second in the league in batting average. And well over five runs a game score, but the Reds have actually outscored them. And it, if anything, it's a more diverse Reds attack. The Reds can hurt, hurt you with the long ball. And they can beat you with speed, which I think, Joe, is one of the reasons for their success because in a tight pitcher's duel, they can manufacture a run with that speed. And and that's too low. Remember, John, they play on AstroTurf, and AstroTurf puts a premium on speed and quickness. So it works right into their favor playing here at home, although they played very well on the road. They're just a very good ball club. And it is now 3 and 1. You know, the, the cliche, I mean, it's said so often, it's become a cliche, but probably a truism in a big game like this. Often, mistakes can turn the game in favor of one team or the other. The second, Pokey Reese gets the high hop, and Cedeno is gone. Two down. But these are two ball clubs that don't make many mistakes as a rule. But no team in baseball is less prone to making an error than the Mets. The Mets have made 68 errors the whole season. No team in history has played this many games and made so few errors as the Mets and given up so few unearned runs, only 20 unearned runs allowed the whole season, which is the, the fewest ever allowed in a full season in the history of Major League Baseball. And it's more difficult for them because they play on natural turf. You get true hops here on Master Turf. Ray Ordonez, which is apropos that Ordonez is up as we're talking defense, because he is certainly the most amazing shortstop to watch on a day in, day out basis. Third move. A strong inning for Paris as Casey dug it out of the dirt. Three ground ball outs. So Paris perhaps has begun to settle in. Some fans brought their Reds caps and their Reds jackets and their Reds jerseys. This fan put the Duke, John Wayne, in a Reds sweatshirt. The Reds, the Duke, and ESPN Atlanta, here we come. Now that is leaving no stone unturned, Joe. John Wayne, the spirit of John Wayne being invoked by that fan here at Synergy Field. And John, just like the seventh game of the World Series, Al Leiter had a very tough time in the first inning, but he got out of it. These two pitches to Vaughn. Look at this fastball just out of the strike zone. Now that sets him up for this overhand curveball. Look at this beautiful breaking ball right there. And Vaughn is frozen. If he would have thrown those two pitches in reverse, I don't think he would have gotten Vaughn. If he'd have thrown him three one curve and follow with the fastball, I think it would have been a problem for him. But he wiggled his way out of that, and that's exactly what he did in the first game, seventh game of the World Series in 97. He was able to get through that first inning, and he was okay after that. Well, there's a fan invoking the spirit of Joe Morgan and the Big Red Machine. Yes, but I work for ESPN now. I can't. I have to be neutral in this ball game. Well, they're not invoking you. Oh, okay. Just the spirit of you from 25 okay. years ago. <laughs> All right. Yeah. They don't care about you now. Right. Uh, old number eight retired. 
from the, uh, the Reds' all-time greats, my partner Joe Morgan, who tonight threw out the ceremonial first pitch. Yeah, that was tough. I was throwing out the first pitch, and the Mets guys were yelling at me. <laughs> but they, are, they have to know I can't have any effect on the outcome of this game. Dimitri Young off the fist to short, or Dunez. Now that is a little simpler for Al Leiter after going to a three and two count to three of the first four hitters he faced. But well, that said at the beginning, John, that was going to be the key. Were the Reds going to be patient enough to allow Leiter to help them out, or are they just going to attack the first good pitch they see? That's a cutter again, and it gets in on Dimitri Young's hand. Another good pitch by Leiter, and you're going to have to try to give him an opportunity to help you as he did in the first inning. Dimitri Young, a switch hitter, came in hitting 304 this year with 14 home runs. So he has gone on one pitch. And here now is Jeffrey Hammonds, the former Stanford University star, U.S. Olympic team star, and the first round draft choice of the Baltimore Orioles. And the cutter low and inside for ball one. But Hammonds never was able to play in a full time basis for Baltimore. He always had problems with injuries. And eventually, the Orioles traded him away. Deep and foul down the left field line. A soaring shot way up into the upper deck, but very much foul. By the way, for those of you tuning in expecting to see NFL Monday Night Countdown, it is airing right now over in our sister ESPN2. The Duke. You'll find it over there. One ball, one strike to Hammonds. And that's a ball. Now, Hammonds has a lot of power, and he's been a, a valuable player for the Reds this year. In part-time duty and only 259 at bats, he's got 17 home runs. And he runs real well. Change out. Two and two. John, we mentioned that the Reds were 27 and 16 against left-handed pitching this year, but Leiter is not your normal left-handed pitcher. He's similar to Pettit of the Yankees. He throws a lot of cut fastballs. He pitches right-handers inside a lot of times. Curveball back to the screen. Whereas most left-handers, their fastballs tail away from the right-handed hitter and they stay towards the outside corner. He will jam you, which opens up the outside corner for him. I, I think that's a great pitch to cut fastball if you use it properly. You do not leave it out over the plate. I mean, all year long, Leiter's actually had better success against right-handers than he's had against lefties. And that's the reason. Curveball punched into left center. That is in there. Base hit. Hammonds with a big turn. He'll hold. A one-out single in the second, and that will bring up the powerful left-handed swinger, Eddie Taubenzi. Well, this is ball stays up a little bit and over the middle of the plate, and that's why Hammonds is able to hit it. That's the only problem you have if you throw a cut fastball, if you leave it out over the middle of the plate, then it becomes just a mediocre fastball, and the right-handers will feast on it. Now, Tommins, he was a little bit surprised to be in the lineup tonight. He doesn't often start against left-handed pitches. But again, Al Leiter is a little bit of a different right. story as a left-handed. Tommins, he has a lot of power inside of the curveball. Tommins, on the other hand, he's only had 58 at-bats against lefties this year, but he has hit 345 against the lefties. And remember, John, this is kind of a Cinderella team, the Reds. So you want all of your guys in there that's played most of the time for you when you have a one game playoff. You want that lineup to be set. The second Alfonso just gets the one. That was interesting. Well I, I think he made the right choice John. You always make sure you get one. And he took the out at second base which keeps Tobinzi at first base. You try something fancy when you're ahead and you help the other team out occasionally. The ball is chopped over Leiter. Leiter actually lets it go because he knows that Alfonso is going to be able to take it. It's just not a good feed. He wasn't in a good position to feed it. Now watch. See, this should be a backhand maybe. They had a chance, but he turns and makes sure of one, which is what you want to do. Hammonds goes in hard. Odonius doesn't make a throw to first base. But he did right in making sure of one. Now Aaron Boone. Outside and high. And they also now have a much slower runner at first Tarbinsley then is speedy Jeffrey Hammonds. All right, so you're talking about Alfonso making the smart play. Right, when you're up two to nothing. Off the fist with that cutter. 
Ordonez. And that ends the inning. One hit, one left. 2 nothing. the Mets lead the Reds. Start the third inning here. Now, don't believe those kids. It's cold here tonight. It's in the 40s with a wind and a drizzle. Meanwhile, Mike Piazza, Al Leiter, and the pitching coach Dave Wallace conferencing at the end of that inning. And he was talking about the curveball, I think. He was saying, you know, the slider, the cutter and the slider are working pretty well. And the only curveball he threw to Jeffrey Hammonds, he hung it and he hit a base, got a base hit to left field. But, I mean, I don't know. Right now, you'd have to feel very comfortable with your stuff if you're lighter in the way that you're pitching. Well, this can be a, a tough night to get the feel on that curveball, right? Yeah. When it's cold like this. And the balls are a little slippery because of the cold weather. Now, Leiter leads off for the Mets. Six hits in 54 at bats this year. A couple of doubles. And five runs batted in, facing Steve Paris. P A R R I S. Paris, who has been pitching professionally for a long, long time, all the way since 1989. So, this guy has been 11 years in becoming an overnight sensation. <laughs> he first got to the big leagues with the Pirates for 15 starts in 1995 and a few starts in 96. And then last year, in midseason, he came up for the Reds and pitched well. They were impressed, but not impressed enough to guarantee him a spot this spring. He did not make the team this spring. Three and one. He's in danger of really putting himself into trouble because Ricky Henderson is on deck. And the last thing you want to do is walk the pitcher leading off an inning. Pitch. Three and two. Ricky Henderson on deck. 2-0. The Mets are leading. Oh, swung at ball four. Actually, it was a pretty good pitch, though. It was a sinking fastball, and it looked like it started about the knees. Watch where it starts. The target starts above the knees, and then it sinks. So it's a pretty good pitch from Paris. And a pitcher like Leiter, he can't lay off that. I'm, I'm telling Leiter next time, Joe, unless it's at the belt, don't swing. Don't swing. Yeah. Now he's talking to the Bulldog. Meanwhile, the Reds' bullpen is getting busy. Ricky Henderson, that's too high, ball one. Well, I, I tell you what, John, if I was the Mets, I would leave Al Leiter alone as we see Denny Nagel up and throwing in the bullpen. I, Leiter is throwing the ball well. He's pitching well. Just leave him alone. <laughs> one ball, no strikes to Henderson. Pops it up, shallow left. Larkin out, Vaughn in. So Henderson who singled his first time in front of Alfonso's two run homer is gone this time two down nobody on and here is Alfonso. Well Jack McKeon told us before the game that just about everybody is available out of his bullpen today except for Pete Harnish who was the starting pitcher last night. Well they Juan Guzman who would be the starting pitcher in the playoffs tomorrow if they make it. Well, Nagel is throwing in the bullpen, and Paris leads off the bottom of the third inning. But I don't know if Nagel's going to have enough time to get loose in that that short period of time. You know, remember he's a starter; he's not used to being a reliever, going down, throwing six or seven pitches, and being ready. Now the curveball missing. At Gardo Alfonso, he launched one over the center field wall his first time. As Nagel continues to get loose, his home run was the first time he's ever had a hit against Steve Paris. He had. Been 0 for 9 in his career against him until that home run. So, so much for the stats. I still believe the fact that Ricky Henderson was at first base had an effect on Paris. He was worried a little bit about Henderson. That's a strike. Three and one. And if you're worried about the runner at first base, you cannot give 100% concentration to the hitter. And that's another way that a guy that steals bases helps your ball club without stealing the base. And that is ball four to Alfonso. It keeps the inning going for the left-handed hitting John Olerud. And now the catcher Tarbins he's out and here comes Don Gullett. The uh, guy who used to be the left-handed ace of the big red machine back in the mid 70s now the pitching coach here. And I think they're buying some time here John so maybe they are trying to give Nagel enough time to get loose in the bullpen. 
Well, McKeon said that he, said he didn't necessarily have a, a philosophy as a manager in a, in a big ball game like this. On the other hand, he said, obviously, we will try to do everything possible to not let them build up any kind of a lead against us. Right. And so he'll be ready to go to that bullpen, and everybody is available. And so, uh, Gullet, back to the dugout. This gives us a chance to tell you that this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. John Olerud rounded out to first his first time. Olerud. Very discerning hitter up there. Walks a lot, but also hits with some authority. He's got 19 homers, 38 doubles, and closing in on 100 RBIs. Piazza is right behind him. And diving back to the bag, Alfonso. He's got nine steals himself over there. He's not a real big threat, even though he's nine and two in stolen bases. He's only caught twice, but not a big threat at first base. Olerud, the left-handed hitter. The Reds the infield playing him to pull the ball. The outfield bunched up towards center. Alfonso is back again. John Pokey Reese plays the deepest second base I think I've seen in a long time on AstroTurf. Because on AstroTurf, the further back you play, the more angles you have to cover. So you have to have a real strong arm and a lot of range to play that deep on AstroTurf. Well, and he's your man then. You're, you're right. One ball, no strikes. And a changeup in there for a called strike. Cookie Rojas flashing some signs from the third base coach's box. The Mets are leading 2 0 in the third inning. Sellout crowd here at what was formerly called Three River Stadium, or uh, Riverfront Stadium. <laughs> well, they all look alike they to me, Joe. Well, Sorry. In the, in, when, well, in the <laughs> mid 70s, they all did look alike. What three, used to three be called, Rivers did look like this. What used to be called Veteran Stadium. What yeah. used to be called Three, well, whatever it was. The Riverfront, Three Rivers, Veterans, they all look pretty much alike. Two and one the cap. Alfonso back. That was pretty good heads up there by Paris because it appeared to me that Alfonso was going to run, maybe on a hit and run, and see now Olerud steps out to see if they're changing the sign. Two and one. He was not running, and the ball is fouled away into the seats off to the left. Two and two. Mike Piazza on deck. Denny Nagel I think he's ready in the bullpen now. Yeah, I think he is too because he's standing around a little bit, which means he knows he has time. If they do pinch hit, he'll have all that half inning to get ready. Down the right field line, that's a base hit. Alfonso off and running to second, heading for third. Young up with the ball, relaying it in. Alfonso will be held at third. A double for Oleru. And the Mets have runners at second and third. Two down and Mike Piazza coming up. And Pokey Reese is yelling back at Dimitri Young, make sure you hit me with the throw. He almost, he threw it over Pokey's head and his short hop, Casey. Olerud pulls this ball down the line. If it goes all the way to the wall, Alfonso would have been able to score. But watch, Young cuts it off. But watch, Pokey Reese has got his hands up for him to throw to him, but he throws it over his head. Watch, over his head there. And it's a short hop to Casey, a tough hop if that ball bounces away. Edgardo would have been able to score easily. Well, now they're walking Piazza with first base open and the left-handed batting Ventura. So I'm guessing, Joe, that this is the last batter that Paris is going to face. Well, it makes a lot of sense because Nagel is definitely ready in the bullpen now. And you have Ventura up. And as you mentioned, it's going to be a bases loaded situation. You cannot fall too far behind in a game of this magnitude. And Jack McKeon perhaps invoking a page from Sparky Anderson's old managerial strategy book which Sparky often would pick a batter from another team said that guy is not going to be allowed to beat us. Well and not only that the thing is tough though John is now Nagel comes in he will be leading off the bottom of the third inning and they were probably going to pinch hit for Paris and that messes up that strategy. So Nagel is coming in the pitcher of the month in the National League in September bases loaded Ventura coming up. But he leaves three runners on the bases for the veteran starting pitcher. 
Denny Nagel injured much of the first half of the season but was nine and two when he finally got it together and came off the disabled list and was five and zero oh in the stretch run the pitcher of the month in the National League. The game may be on the line right now with Alfonso at third Olerud at second Piazza at first and the Mets already with that two run lead and Robin Ventura who is effective against left handed pitching. I think this is a good move by Jack McKeon John. Fastball a strike because the game is on the line. Because let's face it, if the, if the Mets can get a couple of runs here, you're in serious trouble because there's nothing to say they won't scratch out one more here, one more there, and before you know it, you're out of the ball game. So this is a very key at bat. That curve misses. One ball, one strike. Now, so what McKeon basically said was. He liked Nagel versus Ventura better than he liked Paris versus Piazza. Yeah, correct. But also, you have to remember, I think he wanted to Paris to get out of the inning so he could pinch hit for him in the bottom of the inning and bring Nagel in anyway. But now that strategy has to change. Just a bit low. It is two and one. Nagel, who was a 20 game winner just two years ago with Atlanta, a 17 game winner last year. And he threw six innings and 100 pitches just three days ago, Friday night, in Milwaukee. Two and one the count. Three men on. Two men out. Strike. Big call there. Ventura didn't like it. Well, it was a very good pitch, though, John. That ball, I think Ventura was looking something middle in because all the other pitches had been inside, and Nagel cut one across toward the outside corner. Two and two. And it's got as far as it can go now. There's nowhere to put him. Three balls, two strikes, three men on. They'll all be running with two down. But I think you still have to be careful here if you're Nagel. One run is better than three or four. Hamilton would be next. There they go. And he has walked in a run. Ventura gets the bases loaded walk. Alfonso in to score. It is 3 0 Mets. And RBI the 120th RBI of the year for Ventura. Well, he had thrown everything inside except the one strike that he got over, and he was trying to cut one across toward the outside part of the plate again. And I think he was just definitely had made up his mind he wasn't going to give in and give Ventura a ball that he could jack out of the ballpark. Hamilton less of a threat to hit the ball out of the ballpark. This is only the second time Denny Nagel has appeared as a relief pitcher since 1993. Darrell Hamilton the hitter. And that's out of play. John is it's a tough philosophy to have but sometimes you think in your mind you said I'd rather give up one run than to give up three or four here when he was pitching to Ventura he tried to make a good pitch toward the outside corner but you do not want to groove anything to a guy like Ventura because he can hit the ball out of the ballpark. On one to Hamilton. Just misses. One ball one strike. This inning began as you see Olerud Piazza and Ventura the base runners. It started with two down and nobody on when Edgardo Alfonso walked against Paris. Right back to Nagel. And that is the inning. So they get one out of it. But all in all, a pretty good job of damage control by Nagel. Joe Morgan in Cincinnati. The Mets are leading the hometown team 3 0 after two and a half innings in this winner take all playoff game. The tiebreaker. One team advances, one goes home. Coming up Friday on ESPN Sports Century, the 50 greatest athletes at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 Pacific. Number 17 on the list, Urban Magic Johnson. The number one draft pick in the 79 NBA draft after leading Michigan State to the NCAA title. Then he led the Lakers to five championships in the 80s, a three-time NBA MVP. Followed at 10.30 by number 16, the splendid splinter Ted Williams, the last player to hit over 400. He won the Triple Crown in two different years. Inducted to the Hall of Fame in 1966. Mark McGuire's last home run of the season yesterday put him one ahead of Ted Williams on the all time list. Ted Williams, one of the, the greatest who ever played the game. That's coming up Friday on ESPN.
Here is Denny Nagel. And it he is goes up, one. Goes up there hacking, John. <laughs> I like the I like his attitude, Joe. <laughs> Let it fly and maybe the ball will hit the bat. <laughs> Denny Nagel, who grew up in the Baltimore area, <laughs> attended a Rundle High School in Gambrels, Maryland, and as a kid, his dad used to take him to the old Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. And Denny was a great Orioles fan. And his favorite pitcher was Scott McGregor. And when you think of it, some similarities similar, between yeah. these two lefties. Actually, their motions are similar. Now Nagel trying to help his Reds get to postseason play. As his favorite team as a youngster, the Orioles so often got there. But he is down quickly on strikes here. The second strikeout for Al Leiter. And leadoff man, Pokey Reese, will come up. 3-0. The Mets are leading. By the way, Nagel, we're talking about him. And he's been in four different league championship series and a World Series. So Nagel's got lots of postseason experience, but unavailable to them tonight because he pitched on Friday in Milwaukee. Unavailable as a starter. He's in there out of the bullpen now. Curveball for a strike to Pokey Reese, who walked his first time. Nagel, by the way. Won 16 games last year for Atlanta, 20 the year before, and he won 16 for Atlanta and Pittsburgh the year before that. So this this guy had been one of the premier left-handers in the game. High and tight to Reese. Look out! One ball, one strike. Well, Joe, the pressure will start to mount as the Reds. As yes, we start. And, and you talked about it yesterday for the Mets in their game. Once you get to a point where you say I have 12 outs to go or something that really starts to build around the sixth inning if you're down in an elimination game. Another thing to consider is probably right after the Cincinnati Reds bullpen the best bullpen out there is the bullpen of the New York Mets. And that's the reason the way the game is played today. You have middle relievers that are take it to the stopper. Well, Pokey helped him out a little bit there. Two balls, two strikes. And so it makes it difficult for a lot of teams to come back in the late innings. Although the Reds have power, they have speed, they have ways of coming back. Two and two. Barry Larkin on deck. Bends him back with that cut fastball high and tight. Full count now. Robin Ventura plays very close to the foul line at third base. Deep. The shortstop, Ordonez. Not number two. I tell you what, Leiter seems to be getting better with each inning. There again, he, he set Pokey Reese up great. I mean, he had two balls, two strikes through the high fastball, then he came back with the breaking ball. I mean, that tells you right there that he has a lot of confidence in his breaking ball. Now the count is 3 2. Watch, he comes with the breaking ball and he throws a strike with it. So that's, I mean, when a guy can do that, it changes your philosophy as a hitter. You can no longer sit up there at 3 2 and think, well, I'm going to get a fastball, put it in play. Barry Larkin now against Al Leiter. Leiter very much in control right now with a 3 nothing lead, two down, nobody on in the third inning. That's why I said if I'm the Mets, I just leave him alone. I, want, I don't want to talk to him about pitching, pickoffs, or anything. Just let him do his thing, and that's what he's doing right now. Slider missing, 2-0 the count. By the way, Ordonez, who just played that ground ball flawlessly, has not made any errors at all since June 13th. He has gone through 99 consecutive games without making an error. A major league record for a shortstop. Breaking the record set in 1990 by Cal Ripken. Cal had gone 95 consecutive games. And John, it's tough to do as a shortstop because you have to catch almost every ball cleanly or else you're going to make an error. A walk to Barry Larkin. And that keeps the inning going for Sean Casey to come up. The uh, second walk allowed. John at second base and third base you can knock the ball down and still throw the runner out. But if you knock it down at shortstop most of the time because of the long throw you're not going to be able to get the hitter. Sean 
John Casey. Well, the, the Mets outfielders are playing pretty deep. They keep backing up. And I think the reason for that is they do not want someone to hit one in the gap because they're here if you hit a ball in the gap a runner at first base will be able to score pretty easily. Too far in. Sean Casey had an interesting habit when he's up there. I noticed it watching Dan Schulman and Buck Martinez from Milwaukee late last night Joe. He lifts that back leg up and down sometimes as many as three times before the pitch comes down. Well a lot of hitters do a lot of different things to relax themselves. And if you just stand there a lot of times the longer you stand there you tighten up. So it's a way of relaxing his body. That's a foul tip off Piazza. One ball one strike. Last night I get they only had a couple of hundred people there at County Stadium. And the ones who were there picked up on Casey's leg lift of the back leg and they started counting it out loud. <laughs> one ball one strike. If you're if you were still at County Stadium last night you were a great fan <laughs> who notices those little things. Strike on the outside and Casey did not like the call. Well again it's because the way Leiter is working him. He's worked him inside. First at bat, he threw a first pitch off the plate inside here, another fastball in. Now he goes away. And you unconsciously start to look for a ball inside if that's where they're pitching you. Marking at first, the Reds trail 3 0. Greg Vaughn is on deck. Two down. And that, that fastball is too far away. Two balls and two strikes. Casey would just like to get on base somehow and let Greg Vaughn take a shot at tying it up. This will be an interesting pitch because you know Leiter has used certain pitches to set hitters up. That was a, a little cut fastball away. If he follows a pattern, he may want to come back inside. And mark it back to the back at first. And also and a, a very fine base dealer. He had 30 steals this year and was caught only eight times. Two and two to Sean Casey. Al Leiter with a three-nothing lead. And he struck him out with a curve, just as you were talking about it, Joe. He's got he's got great control out there tonight. Great command of his pitches. I really like what he's doing. One man left. Al Leiter of the Mets with a three-nothing lead, a third of the way through it. One game to decide a season. 162 games was not enough to decide between the Mets and Reds going to postseason play. Tonight it will be decided, and so far the Mets have the Mets uh, have the Reds fans a little bit worried. A sellout crowd. For, by the way, for those of you who are looking for the NFL Monday Night Countdown, it's airing right now over on ESPN2. Presented as a public service. Here's a curveball. The bluff of the bunt by Roger Cedeno. And it is 0-1. As Denny Nagel throws him a strike. So the Reds now with the veteran left-hander. But Nagel finds his Reds already down by three runs. Pretty good looking breaking ball there. I think what the Reds are looking for is just, you know, another inning or so out of Nagel just to stem the tide to get back on even footing with the Mets as far as retiring hitters because Leiter is throwing the ball so well. Two curved balls and a fastball in the corner. See you later. One away, so Daniel gone. Well, you mentioned Nagel sets the hitters up very well. He sets him up just like Leiter. He threw him a couple of breaking balls away and then bust the fastball on the inside part of the plate. Now he's given a little Fernando Valenzuela head uh, move there too, isn't he? Now he also hesitated a little longer. Here is Ray Ordonez up and away. One ball and no strikes. Ordonez grounded on to third base his first time. Three nothing. The Mets on top. A two run first inning homer by Alfonso. A bases loaded walk to Ventura in the third for the three runs. Yeah, it's missed. Two and up. Now, not only is there uncertainty 
think about these two teams. We don't know which one of them is moving on and which one's going home. The Houston Astros don't know where they're going. Because if the Mets win, then Atlanta cannot play the wild card team because they're from the same division. That's the rule. Otherwise, Atlanta is entitled to play the wild card team because they had the best record. Over in left center, Jeffrey Hammonds. And Ordonez is gone. Two men down. Take a look at this uh, little uh, added wrinkle by Denny Nagel. Well, he doesn't quite give you the Fernando Valenzuela. Fernando used to look up at the sky and then find the plate on his way to the plate. Two down, and here is Al Leiter. Maybe more like the Elgin Baylor. <laughs> yeah, head fake. Strong inning from Nagel. Greg Vaughn, Dimitri Young, Jeffrey Hammonds coming up. The Reds are down by three. Card tiebreaker, the Mets and Reds. It's 3 nothing Mets as we head to the last of the fourth inning in Cincinnati. And Al Leiter has been the story, as he has been very much in command in this one. The veteran lefty who has been in these big game situations before 1997 he was Jim Leland's choice for game seven against Cleveland and uh, what a performance in the clutch he went six innings allowing two runs on only four hits and had seven strikeouts including that one of Dave Justice with that big curveball we've seen tonight several times well and in that ball game he got in trouble early pitched his way out of a jam in the first inning and then he pitched very well the remainder of the ball game. And today he was in trouble in the first inning, got out of the jam, and he's been in pretty much control since that time. If Al Leiter is to get another shot at a seventh game of a World Series this year, it has to start with a win here tonight in Cincinnati. Greg Vaughn, the hitter, moves him off the plate. One ball and no strikes. And John, if you're the Reds, you have to do some damage. You don't have to get three runs back. You try to just get one or so on the board here. Let him know that you can't hurt him. Because so far, they're not showing him that they can score runs or hurt him in this ball game. And you just want to show him. You have to show a pitcher that he has complete control out there. If you just scratch out a run here, you'll let him know that, hey, we can hurt you. And that'll make a big difference in his confidence out there on the mound. One and one to Vaughn. He's chased that high fastball a couple of times tonight. That one is high and foul off the third base side into the upper deck. One ball, two strikes. 54,621, the pay crowd, a sellout at Synergy Field for this big game. And again, no tickets sold at all until 7 o'clock this morning. Two and two. On deck, Dimitri Young and Jeffrey Hammonds. And you see Leiter again knows exactly how he wants to pitch Vaughn. He had two strikes. He tries to get him to chase the pitch upstairs. He wouldn't chase it. Curveball got it. And it was upstairs. He chased it. Well, and that was a hard breaking ball as well. That wasn't the same curveball he struck him out on in the first inning. This one is a little harder, maybe even just a hard slider. It's not the cut fastball, but it's, see the rotation there, that's a slider. It's harder than the first one that Vaughn took for strike three. One down, not Dimitri Young. Now lighter, as he faces the switch hitting Young, he is already coming off a clutch victory against Atlanta last Wednesday at Shea Stadium. On the fists, and that will go back out of play as Piazza and Olderwood give chase, but it is in amongst the spectators, and it is 0 and 1. At this point, Leiter is throwing just enough strikes to keep the Reds off balance. That was a fastball up and out of the strike zone there. We saw Vaughn swinging a strike fastball up and out of the strike zone. He is doing exactly what he wants to do out there on the mound, and the Reds are going to have to lay off the high fastball, be a little bit more patient, or they're going to be in a big trouble in the next couple of innings. Because again, once you get past the fifth inning, the pressure will start to build. One strike to count to Dimitri Young. Hammond's on deck. And he pulled that one foul. Well, they're hitting some impressive fouls, <laughs> but that's it. 
0 2. We mentioned Leiter against the Braves in that clutch game last Wednesday. Remember, the, the Mets went into that game having lost seven in a row, and he was up against Greg Maddox. But Atlanta shut down on just two runs and five hits. The Mets finally put together a big inning against Maddox and won the game to end that losing streak. Way outside, turned that fastball over. One ball and two strikes. John Olerud capped off a, a huge, I believe it was the third inning against Maddox by hitting a grand slam. I think they had eight consecutive hits off Maddox. And that's just something that was unbelievable to behold if you're sitting there watching. And I was sitting there watching every one of them. Marut got the seventh hit in that sequence. Sharp slider down of the way. Tried to backdoor him with that one. Two balls, two strikes to count. At any rate, the slumbering Mets seem to awaken that game. They've won four out of five starting with that one after losing seven in a row before Lighters Wednesday victory. Two and two. One out. Nobody on. Then went back down there again. A check swing by Young. The appeal denied by Jerry Davis, the first base umpire. Got a veteran crew tonight. Jerry Davis at first. Mark Hirschbeck at second. Ed Rapuano at third. And you have to be patient against Lighter because, again, he's throwing just enough strikes now. You know, to stay ahead in the count where he can get you to chase pitches. Three and two to Young. Third ball popped up. Foul ground. Olerud runs out of room. Not a whole lot of foul territory along the baselines here at Riverfront Stadium. You can see that Leiter has a lot of confidence in his breaking balls. And three two now he's gone to the breaking ball a couple of times. And it's really helped him. He's, yeah. he's had several full counts tonight. Five all, all told. It's only the fourth inning. He's also thrown 64 pitches already. And 33 strikes, but 31 of them out of the strike zone. Three and two. Curveball up the middle. Ordonez. Got him. Wow. Well, that's what you've come to expect. And if you're the Mets pitcher, you say, I, if I can get them to hit it on the ground, I have a great chance with this infield that's playing behind me. Watch what's interesting here is the way Ordonez goes after this ball. He doesn't make a false step and run at an angle. So he goes straight across to cut it off. If you run at an angle, the ball tends to get away from you, and it makes you have to cover a lot more ground in a quicker time. Watch, straight across. See that? He didn't go back. You can't go back on AstroTurf. And there's Leiter. He says, well, that's just normal. I've seen that a few times this year. Yeah, I've seen better. <laughs> I mean, and with Ordonez, truly. Well, the Reds do not end up having a man thrown out often on a ball like that on this turf. That's usually a hit for the Reds. Not many shortstops get that one. Jeffrey Hammond's the hitter. He singled his first time. The only hit of the game for the Reds, and he pops this one up. Ordonez will go for this one as well. Three up, three down. Lighter has shut out Cincinnati on one hit for four innings. Top of the order coming up. Ricky Henderson, Edgardo Alfonso, John Olderud. It is three nothing, New York. Cincinnati, the Mets leading the Reds three nothing as we start the fifth inning. And uh, they're getting a little bit nervous here in Cincinnati now as Al Lighter has shut down the Reds up till now. The division series in Major League Baseball will start tomorrow and right here on ESPN at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific. It's either the Reds or the Astros in Atlanta against Greg Maddox and the Braves. And at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, the world champion Yankees play game one against Ivan Rodriguez, Juan Gonzalez, Rafael Palmero, and the slugging Rangers. That's on NBC. Then at 11 o'clock tomorrow back on ESPN, either the Mets or the Astros against Matt Williams, Jay Bell, and Rubiel Durazo, Randy Johnson and the Diamondbacks. So... A lot of excitement in the first day in these uh, first games at Yankee Stadium tomorrow night. El Duque will get the first game start. Not Roger Clemens, not Andy Pettit, but El Duque. Orlando Hernandez up against 18 game winner Aaron Seeley. And uh, in Atlanta, Greg Maddox right out of the box. Game one. So you're you're in trouble 
against a lot of teams right away against great pitchers and that's what's exciting. I mean, every team in the, the field this year has really had a great year. Ricky Henderson deep down the left field line into the corner hooking this one is off the foul pole home run. Ricky Henderson first ball swinging hits one off the foul. Pole. It is four nothing New York. Ricky has a bad leg, so he says, I guess I'll just trot this time. And the ball hit right off the fair pole. And that's one of the things that Ricky does. I mean, he lulls you to sleep, trying to get ahead of him, knowing that you can't get behind him in the count. Because he's very patient, he gets the first pitch fastball, and he hammers it, and he stands there and watch. He says, I'm not sure if it's going to be fair or foul. I know I got enough of it. Here's Alfonso. Now the top two hitters in the Mets batting order. You know, I mean, traditionally, these are the spots in the order that set up the big sluggers. Today, they've been the offense. Henderson has singled and scored an Alfonso's homer. Now Henderson homers. And you have to remember, there was some doubt about whether Ricky was going to play tonight. Into left field, coming on. Greg Vaughn, he's got it. Nice play. Remember Vaughn going a little deeper tonight than he might ordinarily because of the wet turf. That's a breaking ball toward the outside and Vaughn comes in and he just makes sure he stays on it. Goes down gets down low with the ball stays under the lights. There's a bank of lights that bothers the left fielders here. And Vaughn made sure that he got down low and he was not looking into the lights. Now John Olerud. Olerud grounded out his first time, but then he got a big hit in the third inning that helped set up the third Mets run. He doubled with two down down the right field line. And that's low for ball one. The Reds bullpen is busy. Well, I think this was going to be Nagel's last inning anyway, John, because he's a third hitter. And Sullivan in the, the right hand of the fifth. Yeah, Sullivan the right hander, Reyes the left hander. Change up. One strike. The other thing, I guess, Joe Nagel usually working every fifth day as a starting pitcher. He's had a lot of arm trouble this year, and he's working with just two days of rest. Uh, that's the one little unknown factor for Jack McKeon using Nagel out of the bullpen tonight. Is how long? How much would he have to, to give, and how how long would he be able to give it? Well, especially after you know throwing 100 pitches on Friday. I think part of it is remember we're talking about how young this Reds team is. Nagel has been in the playoffs a lot of times. So you want to get a guy like Nagel in there and give you, you know, get get as much as you can out of him because he knows what the situation dictates. Strike two. Three and two to count. To Olerud. Mike Piazza on deck, a right-handed slugger. Ricky Henderson giving the Mets a big run with one swing of his bat, making it four to nothing here in the fifth. Left field. Vaughn drifting back. He's there now. Olerud retired. Two down. Nobody on. And Piazza will come up. Now McKeon really would like to see, and, and you mentioned, Nagel finish this right. inning. Because he'd be in the same position he was in when he wanted Paris to finish the inning and let Nagel start the next inning. So you want Nagel to get out of this if you can so you can use a pinch hitter for him in the bottom of the inning. But you're in a situation here where you're Nagel you have to make sure that you pitch awfully tough to Piazza. He has walked twice. And uh, one ball no strikes. I don't know if that pitch was supposed to be a curveball or change it look at the movement like a screwball. I think that pitch was supposed to be a ball John. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he did. He was just going to throw him a ball. And if he wants to swing at it like that, go ahead and swing at it. That fit there was another ball. He's going to say, I'm going to throw you some balls. If you want to swing at them, that's up to you. But I'm not going to let you put another number on the board here with two outs here in the fifth inning. And it makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> Piazza has hit 40 home runs so far this year. It's only one home run away for the all-time record for home runs by a catcher in a season. Ball inside, two and one. And home run record by a catcher, by the way, used to be held right here in Cincinnati by Johnny Bench, but was broken 
in New York by Mets catcher Todd Huntley, who's now with the Dodgers. Well, you know, well, he's thrown four balls. Piazza swung at one of them. All these pitches were supposed to be balls. He said, hey, if you swing, go ahead if you want. And you can see Piazza stretching there. So I think his back is bothering. It's a fastball up and in, and Piazza has to lean out of the way, and he was doing a lot of stretching there in between pitches. So I think his back is bothering a little bit, and moving that quickly out of the way didn't help it at all. Three and one. And the change up low. So Piazza walks for the third consecutive time. So the strategy continues to be with Piazza. Let him walk. Yeah, well, you let him walk if you can't make perfect pitches or throw pitches just on the plate moving off that he will swing at. I mean, you have to have respect for the big hitters in the lineup. The Mets learned that when they were in Atlanta and they experienced problems with Chipper Jones. He was the big bat in the lineup and they pitched to him several times and they paid the price. I mean, Chipper Jones and the Atlanta pitchers plunged the Mets into that late season slump, the seven game losing streak. The three game sweep in Atlanta. And it's ball one to Robin Ventura who has hit a double play ball and drawn a bases loaded walk against Nagel at forced in the third run but Chipper Jones hit four home runs in those three games at Turner Field and each one of the four put the Braves ahead. Change up inside. Well you do not want to walk Ventura here. So you're going to have to go after him. I think you have to give him a pitch to hit now. Ventura's been very patient this at bat. He says, I'll wait till I get a pitch to hit. And Daryl Hamilton becomes an RBI threat if you put a man in second base. Hamilton on deck. Well, he's one pitch away from moving Piazza over to second. And if you're the Mets, what do you do here? Piazza's win one of your big RBI men. Do you turn him loose 3-0? Yeah. Ventura. I would turn him loose. I would. Ventura. I'm, I'm turning him loose. But Nagel walks him on four pitches. And now you really wonder, Joe, I mean, how much does Nagel have left? I mean, he looks like a guy who's who spent to to my eyes. Well, I, I think what he was trying to do there, he was again, he's not going to give in. And he showed us that when he walked in the run with the bases loaded on Ventura. He was trying to get a hit of him with a fastball in. And before you knew it, he was behind 2-0 and and then 3-0, and and he just could not afford to give in at that point. It's a very thin line that he's walking out there, but you have to walk that line when you get this far behind. You're, you're behind, and you just cannot afford to give up a long ball or something like that to Piazza or Ventura. He made the mistake with Ricky Henderson. You can't make that same mistake here in this inning. Not Daryl Hamilton hitting 285 for the year against left-handed pitchers. Contact hitter. Curve of beauty. And it is 0-1. Hamilton, who accelerated his game when leaving Colorado, opening the year with the Rockies, he came to the Mets and hit 341, or has hit 341 the rest of the year with the Mets. Inside. One ball, one strike. Hamilton is 0 for 2 tonight. You see what he hit with the Rockies versus what he has hit with the Mets. Not bad with the Rockies either, right? 3 0 3. Of course, for the Rockies, that's below average. That curve low and outside. Now he's behind Hamilton, 2 and 1. Two, two on walks, one to Piazza. He's at second. One to Ventura. He's at first. You see the bullpen for the Reds in action. Sullivan, the right hander. Reyes, the left hander. Ball sprayed foul into the crowd. Two balls, two strikes. A run is already in. The Mets have a 4 0 lead. We're in the fifth inning. Cincinnati obviously could ill afford to fall any further behind. Jack McKee and Don Gunner. Bobby Valentine working the gun. Change up. Just did get a piece of it. Denny Nagel with his club down by four runs. The Reds not only have not scored against Al Leiter, they've only had one hit against Leiter through four innings. That's 
a bloop foul into the crowd. Still two and two to Hamilton. John, the only thing you can say if you're the Reds is that they have forced Leiter to throw 67 pitches in four innings. That's the only positive if you're the Reds you can look at and say, hey, he's thrown a lot of pitches. Maybe he will tire and maybe we'll be able to score a couple before they can get some relievers in there. Now it is full, but you have to get out of this inning first before you can even think about that. And, uh, talk about throwing lots of pitches. Nagel has now thrown 25 pitches in this inning alone. And 42 since he came into the game in the third inning. He still has to make a good pitch. He just can't give in here. Runners go. Fastball. And they pop up foul. Aaron Boone starts over, but it's into the crowd. And that was a good pitch. Fastball in, and you can see Hamilton has been fighting the fastball in off. And watch this. Fastball in. That's not a give up pitch. You throw the fastball, but you make sure you get it inside right there. Well, that's the breaking ball and the pitch before, but the last pitch with a fastball in. This is the ninth pitch to Darrell Hamilton in this at bat. The runners go. Fastball. Charging. Barry Larkin on the run. The throw. Not in time. Hamilton with excellent speed beat it out. Tough play for Larkin. Again, sometimes when you play deep on AstroTurf, and they chop the ball. It's a very difficult play because you can't plant yourself to make a strong throw. He charges and he gets rid of it. But remember, Hamilton runs well down the line. And here comes Larkin. And he throws high to first base. And not in time. And the score is a base hit. You see, he may not have had Hamilton anyway with a good throw. So Daryl Hamilton with the infield hit, but it does not deliver the run. And now Roger Cedeno, the switch hitter. Cedeno, not a power hitter, not a big RBI man. On the other hand, Cedeno this year has hit 287 with runners in scoring position. He's 0 for 2 in this game. And Nagel, who has thrown so many pitches in this inning already, 28 pitches in the inning, working on only two days of rest. So again, we're at a crossroads. I mean, the Reds right now need this out just to stay alive in this game. Oh, so Daniel helped him out. And he knew it in mid-swing. He tried to check. One ball, one strike. So Daniel has hit only 200 this year as a right-handed hitter. 333 as a lefty. Back to the screen. Well, Nagel came right after with a fastball there. And, and that was going to be my next point, John. I don't know which pitch Nagel can really rely on right now. He normally has a good enough fastball at his spots, change up, and breaking balls. But like he said, he's struggling a little bit out there, not only with his pitches, but with his control. The crowd of over 54,000 on its feet. Three men on, two men out. The curveball is lofted foul. And I don't think that was with two strikes especially where he wanted that curve. No. Ball. Again he's struggling with his pitches and he's just trying to gut it out and make sure he can get out of this inning. And look at that look of determination right there. So Daniel with three men on. Struck him out in the dirt with a changeup. He got a lot of help from Cedeno, but he gets the job done. So the Mets add one on the Henderson homer, but they do not break it open. The Reds are still breathing, but they have only one hit against Leiter, trailing 4-0. Tonight, in pursuit of the playoffs from Cincinnati, Ricky Henderson leading off the fifth inning. It hit the foul pole. And the Mets lead now 4-0. Denny Nagel, who gave up the home run, Probably out of the game now as the Reds have the last third of their batting order coming up against Al Leiter. And John, I think you have to give both of these teams a lot of credit, you know, for what they've been able to come back from this weekend. On Thursday, when the Mets lost to the Braves, since that time they've basically been on a suicide watch because any game that they would lose basically would have eliminated them from contention. They would have they were two down after that game with only three to go. And they've been able to get to this point. Eddie Chaubinzi with a big swing. 
end at his 0 1 as he faces Al Leiter. Denny Nagel, after leaving the mound in the fifth inning, got back into the dugout. It's the emotion of the big game in October when it's all on the line. Right to the second baseman, Alfonso. That's one of the hardest hit balls of the game by Cincinnati against Leiter, but it ends up ending in bad luck. have not had a man hit a ball out of the infield since Jeffrey Hammond single back in the second inning. We're in the fifth inning now. Here is Aaron Boone. That single by Hammonds in the second inning is the only hit of the game for Cincinnati. The pitcher spot due up after Aaron Boone. That's called a strike up and in. Chris Steins, number 12, he is out of the on-deck circle to pinch it for Nagel. Danny Graves is up in the bullpen. That's foul straight back. Oh, and to the count. There's Danny Graves, ordinarily a closer for the Reds. One of two that Jack McKean likes to use to finish off again. The other, the rookie, Scott Williamson, but... Graves is up, and we're only in the last of the fifth inning. Jack McKeon at this point is more concerned about keeping his team in the game so that there might be something to close later on. Well, Scott Williams had been struggling a little bit lately anyway, and Graves has been pitching well. Curveball, I just got a piece of that one. That's Again, Leiter's throwing just enough strikes, John. And he's throwing pitches that start in the strike zone. They break out, and he's been able to get the Reds to chase a lot of them. He's pitching a very smart ball game. Scott Williamson, a, uh, a strong candidate for Rookie of the Year in the National League. He struck him out with a shoulder-high fastball. And again, that's exactly what he wants to do. He knows what he's doing out there. That's not an accident. And those pitches aren't out of the strike zone because he's wow. He is taking advantage of a lot of these young hitters being a little bit over aggressive with two strikes. Now, I mean, he this is intentional. The high fastball up and out of the strike zone. He gets him to chase it. If he would have not have swung at this pitch, then I think he would have come back with a slider or a cut fastball. But he knows that he's in command and he's getting these guys to help him out a little bit. Well, you know, Al Leiter. He had a career high 15 strikeouts against the Cubs back on the 1st of August in seven innings. But since then, coming into play tonight, only 37 strikeouts in 66 and two third innings. And tonight, five strikeouts in four and two thirds. It was just that 15 strikeout game against the Cubs took something out of him there for a while. Steins chases the high one out of the zone. See, again, he knows what he's doing, and, and the, the Reds collectively as a team will have should sit together and say, hey, we're helping him out too much. We're going to have to be a little more patient. Give him a chance to help us, and they're not doing that. To third, Robin Ventura. A ground ball to the Mets infield. That's an out, almost invariably. Three up, three down. No hit since the second inning. Under the six, four nothing Mets. Field in Cincinnati, and the New York Mets, with the huge crowd on hand, have uh, shut down the Reds. Al Leiter has smothered their offense for five innings, and now a man who usually doesn't come into a game until maybe the eighth inning or so, Danny Graves, 27 saves. But at this point, Jack McKean is looking for somebody just to save a chance for them to come back. Yeah, he's he's saying that this is a save opportunity. Save us. For the next couple of innings, give us a chance to chip away here at Al Leiter. And he's got another guy to use late in the game. It's Scott Williamson if the opportunity presents itself. Now, Ray Ordonez, the eighth place hitter, taking ball one. Graves, a sinker baller, acquired from the Cleveland Indians before the training deadline two years ago. The deal that sent John Smiley up to Cleveland for the stretch run that year. And that has worked out pretty well for the Reds. This guy's been a very valuable man out of the bullpen. He's only 26 years old. And has put two strong seasons in a row in for the Reds out of the bullpen. And that sinker misses. 2-0 to Ardonez. 
Al Leiter do up next. By the way, Joe, you mentioned the high pitch count for Leiter through four innings. He just had a nine pitch fifth inning. And that really helped them out. They chased a lot of pitches out of the strike zone. There you see him in the on deck circle practicing a sacrifice, and he will get the opportunity to do so. Cardonias gets the walk to start the inning. Tomorrow, the division series will begin in Major League Baseball. And here's the schedule. Either the Reds or the Astros in Atlanta against Greg Maddox and the Braves at 4 o'clock Eastern, 1 Pacific. Then the Texas Rangers at Yankee Stadium against the world champion Yanks, Aaron Seeley, and El Duque, Orlando Hernandez on NBC. And then at 11 o'clock Eastern, 8 Pacific, either the Mets or the Astros at Bank One Ballpark against Randy Johnson and the Arizona Diamondbacks. So it's a great day of baseball, and it's just the beginning. That 11 o'clock game on ESPN tomorrow night. Now lighter. Bunts at it, but fouls. Leiter's had 10 sacrifice bunts this year to lead the all Mets pitchers in that category. <laughs> they threw the ball in to get a new ball. Danny Graves tossed it in, and Leiter kind of got buzzed by that one. He had to lean back out of harm's way. And the Reds have issued seven bases on balls to the Mets, and the Mets have been very patient. And have allowed them. There's the bunt. Nice. Chavez, he's only played a pokey Reese at first. Now, Leiter is kind of limping off the field here, and the Mets have the bullpen busy. Well, you see Leiter running down the line. And you can see the grimace on his face tells you something is wrong with his legs or his lower body, lower part of his body. In the bullpen, starter Kenny Rogers is warming up. He, like Cincinnati's Denny Nagel, pitched a big ball game on Friday. Uh, he would be the call for the Mets if they win this game. In game two of the division series, which if the Mets make it would be in Arizona against the Diamondbacks. Ricky Henderson, and he's had a big night. He started the game with a single just in front of Alfonso's homer in the first inning. And then in the fifth inning leading off, he homered himself. So Ricky making an, an impact in a big game. We've seen that before. the dirt and it is 2 and 0. Oh. Danny Graves not looking very sharp coming on here in the sixth inning. Well his sinker is starting too low and he's not able to throw strikes with it. For a sinker to be effective you at least have to start it in the strike zone and let it sink out. His is not starting high enough to get any help from the hitters. And the Mets are very reminiscent of last year's Yankees in that regard. This may be the most patient team or one of them in the majors. They've been very patient tonight because just because a pitch is a strike doesn't mean you have to swing at it. They will take the quality strikes like that pitch was over the outside corner. So Ricky took it and they have allowed the Reds pitchers to miss and ended up walking seven hitters so far in this ballgame. Only two teams in the majors have walked more often than have the Mets this year. That is caught by Sean Casey. What a play. an excellent play by Casey. We talk so much about the infielders on both of these teams that sometimes the first baseman get overlooked. Both Ola Root and Casey do a good job at their position. Perfect positioning here because I mean look at this ball. That ball is right in the hole. Casey way off the line it dives and makes the catch. Now to his credit Ray Ordonez had stopped and was headed back to second base even as Casey was making that play. So had Casey not made the play, Ordonez might not have scored, but this would nonetheless be a quite a different story that would be at least first and third with only one out had he not caught that ball. Here is Alfonso. And a slider low and outside. Alfonso has hit a two-run homer 
He has walked and scored a run. And he has hit a fly ball to shallow left, caught on a nice play by Vaughn. So Edgardo Alfonso, in the year of his life, is having a huge game in uh, another in a string of critical games for the Mets. A sinker in the dirt. Joe, you mentioned two games out with only three to play. Extremely long odds. Only one team in history has gone into the last three games, two games out, and made postseason play. 1962, San Francisco Giants, who ended up having to have a tiebreaker playoff against the Los Angeles Dodgers that year. And they won it. But they played two out of three in those years. That's a foul out of play, yeah, for the tiebreaker. You could lose the first game at that time and still come back to win it, which the loser of this game will not have that luxury. This is one game for all the marbles. <laughs> it's as tense as you can get. And Al Leiter, who's been in these big games before, has just been spectacular. Five innings, only one hit allowed. Kenny Rogers still heating up in the bullpen, though, as we saw Leiter limp off the field after his punt. Two and one. That is base hit into the alleyway, left center field. It goes to the wall on the turf. Scoring is Ordonez. That leadoff walk has turned into a run, and Edgardo Alfonso has had an MVP performance tonight in this huge game for the Mets. It is now five to nothing. And there are a lot of people around New York and around the country that say that he is the most valuable player on this Mets team. He hits that low pitch very, very well. I mean, this is a bullet, first of all, and it finds a gap in left center field. And I mean, on this wet turf, there was no chance to cut it off. So he goes into second with a double and an RBI. And Leiter, very happy that he now has one more run to work with here in the sixth inning. So a leadoff walk to the eighth place hitter. That's a run. The sinker too low to John Olerud. By the way, the Mets' first two hitters in the order, Henderson and Alfonso, have had four hits in seven at bats, plus a walk, four runs scored, four runs batted in. Ricky Henderson, Edgardo Alfonso, show. And outside of Cleveland, these top three hitters with the Mets get on base more often than any other top three hitters in the majors. You have to go to, to Lofton, Vizquel, and Roberto Alomar to find something similar. And the top two guys in particular have been killing the Reds tonight. Henderson, a single and a homer. Alfonso, a two-run homer, a walk, and now an RBI double. It's 108 RBIs this year for Edgardo Alfonso. That curve is shot right back. And Graves, he had the quick reaction, and he gets the out. He saved a run. Man, that was clobbered right back at it. But another run. It is now five to nothing. Top of the order coming up for the Reds. Al Leiter. And the frustration mounts for the Reds. Edgardo Alfonso, what a day. Steve Paris, the starter, out early. Alfonso. And the big home run by Henderson. That kind of a night for the Reds so far. Nonetheless, still time for the Reds to mount a comeback, but now, Joe, they're getting to that point where they're starting to count the outs. They have 12 outs of life left to them after a, a brilliant 162 games. They've won 96 games, never since the wild card format came into baseball has a team won 96 games and not made the, the postseason. It's the top of the order for the Reds. It's time to mount the comeback. Well, again, you do not have to get four or five runs all at once, but you do have to get a couple because you're not going to have many opportunities to score five runs in an inning this late in the ball game because of the bullpen of the Mets. So you're going to have to get one or two here, one or two there, and then try to make a big statement in the eighth or ninth inning. Now Leiter, 76 pitches thrown, one hit allowed, and two walks given up. Pokey Reese, the hitter. One ball, no strikes. And we'll keep a close eye on Leiter because, as we saw, he is not quite right. He grimaced running out that bunt in the first half of this inning and then limped off the field. 
In the air, left field, Ricky Henderson. Right behind Kenny Rogers out there, and Ricky capturing that one with a flourish. Well, John, the Mets have been just the opposite of the Reds, their hitters. The Mets have forced the Reds to throw a lot of pitches, 115 pitches, whereas Leiter has been a guy that the Reds have helped out, swinging a lot of bad pitches, as we see Ricky. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't know how to describe that. Yeah, Ricky. He's having a big night. Maybe you hadn't noticed. Here's Barry Larkin. And that's high and tight for ball one. Well, some guys, it's all about the big stage and the bright lights. And Ricky Henderson is one of those guys. Barry Larkin on the corner for a strike. The Reds have certainly come a long way because before this season started, Barry Larkin was talking about wanting to be traded to a team that was committed to winning, which he thought he did not see here in Cincinnati. It's turned into a great year for the Reds, but so far tonight, they have just been completely throttled by Al Leiter and the New York Mets. One and two the count. On the left field line, but foul. Remember Kenny Rogers head of the bullpen out of play. One ball, two strikes. If the Mets win as the wild card team, they would go to Arizona and they'd be up against Randy Johnson tomorrow night at Bank One Ballpark at 11 o'clock Eastern Time on ESPN. There's Carl Lindner, who as of just a few days ago is the new owner of the Cincinnati Reds. He's got the, the same look on his face as the members of his team right now down in that dugout. And John, I'll tell you one thing. If the Mets win, it'll probably be the first time in history someone looked forward to facing Randy Johnson. Looking forward to whoever they got out there. Yeah. If they had Koufax or Cy Young or whomever. They'd be looking forward to it. Bring him on. That's pulled foul by Larkin. Two balls, two strikes. The Mets were all but eliminated going into the weekend. And Bobby Valentine was vilified in New York because his teams folded at the end. He'd never been to the postseason with a team. Well, if they win this game and they're leading 5-0, it'll be quite the opposite. Valentine's team will have done something at the end of the season that only one other team has ever done. Two games down, three to go. Only one team in history has overcome those odds to make the postseason. And Valentine has managed 1,703 games without making it to the postseason. That's out of play. And that's the fourth longest streak in the history. And Jack McKeon has managed 1,340 games without making it to the postseason. So one of these guys will at least change that after tonight's ball game. Valentine's total of games managed without being in the postseason is the fourth highest total since 1900. Two and two. Slider in the dirt. Three and two. Sean Casey on deck. By the way, Valentine's name would be ever, would be forever removed from that list if they win tonight. I mean, if you make it to the postseason, you're not, you're not on any of those lists anymore. Jimmy Dykes who managed nearly 3,000 games, Clark Griffith over 2,900 games, and Paul Richards over 1,800 games. who had the most games managed in the big leagues without ever getting to the postseason. I might add, those are three of the, the top managers in Major League history, all well-respected. And the fans get into it. They need a base runner. Strike three called! He changed up and got it over there, and Larkin didn't like the call. Well, Larkin thought the ball came around the plate. He thought it was outside. So
So Al Leiter does it again. Well, Leiter again is throwing just enough strikes to keep the Reds at bay. Too close to take with two strikes. Bobby Valentine had no doubts it was in there. The Reds have had only one ball out of the infield since the second inning. That was the fly ball to left in this inning by Pokey Reese. Here's Sean Casey. Two down, nobody on. Casey has fly deep to left and struck out. Off the outside. Barry thought he had won a walk there. And that was important. I mean, just to try to get on base for Casey and Bond to follow. 2 0. Great ball on deck. Well, Ricky Henderson, as is almost always the case when he's in a road game, grabbing the attention of the fans to third base. Ventura. And that is the inning. That makes 10 in a row retired by Leiter. No base runner allowed since the third. No hits allowed since the second. Now to the top of the seventh inning in Cincinnati. Not much to cheer about for the big Reds crowd of more than 54,000. It's been all Mets. Five to nothing New York with Cincinnati having only one hit. Meanwhile in Miami it is uh, Buffalo and the Dolphins. The Bills and Dolphins scoreless in the first quarter down there that game being televised on ABC on Monday Night Football. Here is Mike Piazza. So far the Reds have pitched around him. They've walked him three times once intentionally. Danny Graves that's a cold strike with a high slider. Well after being down five to nothing and him leading off the inning now they have to get him out. They have to go after him now. They cannot afford just to pitch around him. He's leading off the inning and you're already down by five runs. The curveball. He's ahead of him all in two. Well, I mean, that's what you have to do now. You you can no longer think about the game plan or the strategy that you had early in this game. You just have to let it go now if you're the Reds. All in two. The sinker. It's shallow right. Pokey Reese recovers. Not number one. Now, Marty Aronoff gave me a statistic that I already knew. I just didn't know the numbers. The Reds, in Al Leiter pitching to the Reds, he has thrown first pitch balls to 11 of the 21 hitters. That doesn't count the bad pitches that they swung at that became strikes. So, I mean, over half the pitches to the hitter leading off of first pitch to the hitters have been balls. And they have not been able to take advantage of that because they've swung at so many bad pitches. And the Mets have been just the opposite. They've been very patient and they've worked themselves in the good hitters counts and they've taken advantage of it. The Mets have drawn seven walks in this game. Robin Ventura with a one ball one strike count. In fact the fourth and fifth place it is the two Mets sluggers Piazza and Ventura have walked a total of five times between them. And, and John it may not be a coincidence guys like Ricky Henderson Ola Rue, Piazza Ventura. These guys have been in postseason. They've been in big games before and they know they have to be patient and that's nothing against the Reds because they have nothing to hold their heads down about. But you've got a lot of young guys who are overly aggressive who want to do well in these situations and they're going out of the strike zone a little bit. And talk about the difference in the body language between the two dugouts. Everybody in the Mets dugout is standing. Wow nice pitch. Ventura is gone. Two down. Of course, we saw the Reds dug out a very somber place right now. A worried place in the Mets dug out. The, uh, well, we don't see it in that picture, but uh, a lot of the guys on their feet and very excited looking, except in that corner. Two down, nobody on, and here is Daryl Hamilton. Hamilton has rounded out twice and had an infield single, a shortstop. Too low. 
2 0 the count. That's the part of the dugout I saw. And in the Reds dugout, everybody seated and somber. Just as are the Reds fans now. 3 0 the count. Bills have gone ahead of the Dolphins in the first quarter, Monday Night Football in Miami. And Hamilton draws the eighth walk issued by Cincinnati pitching in this game. Two walks have turned into runs, and another walk came with the bases loaded to Robin Ventura to force in a run. Five to nothing. The Mets are leading. Jack McKeon. I mean, there's not much for him to do at this point. He's trying to hold the line as best he can. But what he needs is for the offense to come alive against Al Lighton. Here's Roger Cedeno. 0 for 3. That's a strike. In the last half of this inning, Greg Vaughn, Dimitri Young, and Jeffrey Hammonds do up. We told you about those top two hitters for the Mets. Henderson Alfonso who have had four hits in seven at bats plus a walk four batted in that curveball is a strike the top two hitters in the Reds lineup are 0 for 4 with two walks and then the middle the next three hitters Casey Vaughn and Young are 0 for 7 so the first five guys in the Reds batting on have really been shut down the whole lineup has been shut down they have only one hit off the leg of Danny Graves Aaron Boone hustling over and throwing to Larkin at third to make sure that Hamilton stopped at second and is Danny Graves okay hit sharply right back at him by Roger Cedeno who stops at first alongside Mookie Wilson Graves did hustle over to oh, cover third base but uh, now he tried to walk and uh, he's hurting This wet turf, the ball gets back awfully fast, and you can see he really didn't have any chance to react. And anytime that turf is a little wet, now watch this ball was skid. He hits it. And it hits him on the knee, and he really starts to chase it, but you can see that he's really hurting there, his right knee. And, and he's having trouble walking. Yeah. He tried to take a step again. Scott Sullivan immediately gets up in the bullpen. Not Graves is trying to shake it off and is walking back toward the mound. Jack McKean alongside, along with the trainer and pitching coach Don Gullett with his back to you. Well, he's tougher than a lot of guys if he's going to try it there when he could barely walk a couple of steps. Uh, out of the University of Miami pitched in the College World Series and suffered a serious knee injury in the College World Series. And he's trying to convince Don Gullett and uh, Jack McKeon that he's healthy enough to continue. done so. Well, we saw Bartolo Colon with Cleveland get nailed on the, the shin earlier this year on, on uh, Sunday Night Baseball and stay in the game. Key moment came early in this one. Edgardo Alfonso with Henderson aboard the second hitter of the game. Launched one over the head of Jeffrey Hammonds and out of the yard. A two run homer against Steve Paris and the Mets six pitches into this game. We're two runs ahead and they have been ahead ever since. Alfonso has since scored another run and driven home another run. Big night for Edgardo Alfonso. Here is Ray Ordonez. Hamilton at second, Cedeno at first, two down. Five to nothing next. On one. Here's Hamilton. But two down in this inning, he walked. 
Captain Cedeno alongside Mookie Wilson at first base, then hit the single. Looked like it was right below the knee, at least where, where Graves had pointed when the trainer came out. Well, anytime you have trouble standing, it is your knee because that's the weakest part. You know, if you have a bad calf or a bad hamstring, you can still stand pretty easily, but it's the knee that buckles on you. Now, light of the pitcher is out on the on deck circle. The Mets bullpen is quiet. That curveball bounced foul. Over to Cookie Rojas, the third base coach. Oh, and two the count. Cookie Rojas, he could pick it. Infielder, he played for the Phillies and a few other teams. So my memory of him with the Phillies was uh, a double play partner with Bobby Wine. Yeah. yeah. One of the best. Yeah, they were. And Ruben Amaro played there for a while. They were kind of interchangeable parts. Had a long conversation with him today about Cuba and some of the great players they have over there and the fact that they want to try to get them over here in the next couple of years. Two on, two out, two strikes. Curveball almost hit Ordonez. Five runs, seven hits for the Mets, no runs, and one hit for the Reds. The Mets win, they go to Arizona. But if the Reds come back and win, they go to Atlanta. Hence, the Houston Astros are sitting in Houston, not yet knowing where they're going. Houston knows that it's going, but they might be going to Atlanta, or they might be going to Arizona. So they have not been able to to leave yet. There's our lighter on deck. Although, as Marty Aronoff points out, Joe, ever the statistician. Houston is pretty well equidistant between Atlanta and Phoenix. Curveball got it. Two men left. The Reds have nine outs left to them. Vaughn, Young, and Hammonds coming up. Five nothing Mets. Reds. Well, they're, they're running out of time to mount one. The Mets five. The Reds nothing. One game tiebreaker playoff. Don't forget now. Coming up. After the season, on Friday, November the 5th, the Players' Choice Awards. All major leaguers have cast their votes to recognize the best in the game in 11 different categories, including the player of the decade of the 90s. The nominees include Greg Maddox, Barry Bonds, and Ken Griffey Jr. Greg Maddox, of course, pitching tomorrow for Atlanta in the first game of the division playoffs against either the Reds or the Astros at Turner Field, 4 o'clock Eastern on ESPN. Rangers and Yanks, 8 o'clock Eastern on NBC. And then at 11 o'clock from Bank One Ballpark, either the Mets or the Astros against the Arizona Diamondbacks and Randy Johnson, also on ESPN, 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, tomorrow night. And John, to this point, Al Leiter has pitched a very intelligent ball game. He's used the Reds' aggressiveness against them by getting them to chase pitches out of the strike zone. So what do you do if you're the Reds? You have nine outs left, and someone in that club dugout has to take charge and say, look, We've got to use these nine outs to the best of our ability. What that means is make sure we get good pitches to hit. Do not go up there and try to hit the ball out of the ballpark. Let's try to get a few runners on base any kind of way and see what happens. Greg Vaughn has struck out twice against Leiter. The problem also for Vaughn, he's only been up one of those two times with a runner on base. The Reds have had only three base runners against Leiter all through the game. One ball and no strikes. The Mets have had 15 base runners. And had Leiter not been so dominant, the Mets might be a little frustrated because they've only scored five. They've left nine men on. Dimitri Young on deck. Well, he's taken each of those pitches. Well, that's what you have to do. You have to be a little more patient than you have been early in this ball game. Danny Nagel back in the dugout for the Reds. Those and Dolphins tied up in the first quarter in Miami on Monday Night Football. Over the outside, he dropped that one in there for a strike. Two and one to Vaughn. They have not had a base runner since the third inning when that man, Barry Larkin, walked. They have not had a hit since the second when Jeffrey Hammonds singled, which up to now is their only hit. Leiter has six strikeouts. And they had the big cut at that one, but fouled it straight back. Two and two. 
Vaughn tied with Atlanta's Chipper Jones for third in the National League with 45 home runs. Only McGuire and Sosa have gone deep more often than this man. Two and two to count. And that was the same thing last year. Only McGuire and Sosa popped up on the curveball. Playable for Piazza. And Vaughn is retired. That is in the National League. There were only ones with more home runs. Let's take a look at these strikeouts. He has six strikeouts. That was a strike. Good pitch. Chases one out of the strike zone. Another bad pitch strikeout. Another bad pitch strikeout. Another bad pitch strikeout. I mean, it just goes on and on. Yeah, Larkin thought that one was a bad pitch. Right. It just goes on and on. I mean, they have helped him out a lot, but again, that's a very intelligent pitcher out there on the mound. He knows exactly what he's doing and where he's throwing the baseball tonight. He is at the top of his game tonight. Dimitri Young off the fist, a bloop. But Hamilton gets there. That is only the third fly ball to reach the outfield hit by the Reds tonight against Leiter. Two down to Jeffrey Hammonds. Well you know Al Leiter when they got in their charter fight last night he has one of those little personal VCRs and he brought not movies but tapes of the Cincinnati Reds and while they flew here last night he was studying those tapes. And we've got time out now as a couple of uh, apparently drunken fans have run out of the field here. So two down, nobody out in the seventh inning. And the, the two fans are being taken care of by of Cincinnati's finest. With two down in the seventh and the Mets leading five to nothing. Well, Leiter bemused by it all. But you know, Joe, I mean, he studied those videotapes and perhaps didn't even have to. Ordonius, by the way, Ended up with one of those guys' wallets. Well, he didn't need it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if the ball just, if the wallet just dropped out of the guy's pocket, <laughs> or if Ordonia saw an opportunity and seized it. But he returned it. Jeffrey Hammonds the hitter. Two down, nobody on in the seventh inning. Hammonds with a single, the only hit of the game. He's popped out. High in the air, left center field. Hamilton back near the warning track, calling off Henderson. Look out! Henderson wanted it. And he got it. Only six outs remaining for the Reds now. 13 in a row retired. Postseason play for the first time since 1988. Daryl Hamilton, I got it, I got it, I got it. No, Ricky's. It's Ricky's night, apparently. And now lighter. Oh my lord. But all as well that ends well. Ricky did make the catch. There was no collision. Here is lighter to lead it off against Danny Graves. On ball and no strike. Joe. Last year we were at Wrigley Field for the the tiebreaker. The Cubs and the Giants. It was quite a night. A memorable night at Wrigley Field. The Cubs won that one to move into the postseason. 1995, it was the Kingdom, the Seattle Mariners and the Anaheim Angels. We were there for the Western Division title. And I bring that one up in particular because that was the Randy Johnson show. I mean, Randy Johnson just blew away the Angels. I believe they got one run against him on a home run by Tony Phillips, and that was it. And Al Light is certainly doing it in a far different way than the big unit four years ago, but equally as effective if not more so. Yeah, very intelligent pitching tonight by Leiter. That I think that's the key. Johnson just overpowered him. 
through the legs of Grave. Barry Larkin, though, gets it. And Lander limping up the line again. And there is one away. John, you know what's interesting is that the Mets were four and five against the Reds this year, but the four victories all came here at Riverfront Stadium. That's very interesting, especially since the Mets are a natural turf team and the Reds are an AstroTurf team and they beat them on their home ground. Ricky Henderson has singled and scored a run, flied out, homered, and lined out. Well, the Mets had an excellent road record this year, 47 and 34 away from Shea Stadium. The Reds, meanwhile, were the best team in baseball on the road. It wasn't until late in the season that the Reds started winning here at home. The Reds had uh, six more wins on the road than they had right here in their own ballpark. Henderson takes two high, one ball, one strike. So you, you recall when the Reds played their series in New York, it was back in June, and they were one of the teams that helped plunge them into their, that first losing streak that the, the Mets went through, an eight-game losing streak. Ricky takes a strike. He didn't think so. One ball, two strikes. Danny Nagel involved in a quite a discussion there in the Reds dugout. For Steins and Nagel talking it over. That curve ball lifted to center. Jeffrey Hammonds. And that's the second out. So Henderson is gone. Two down. Remember, after the ball game, stay tuned for baseball tonight on ESPN. We'll have the complete story from the post-game clubhouses. Peter Gammons will have his analysis. Also, Chipper Jones sounds off on an MVP-type year, as well as the playoffs upcoming. That's all on baseball tonight. So we'll be bringing you right back for complete post-game coverage. So stay tuned to ESPN after the game. And of course, Joe, whatever team does win this game, and the Mets are leading 5-0, it will be a night to remember. And we were just mentioning that night to remember at Wrigley Field last year. Sometimes the great days can be fleeting in this game. Jim Riggleman, who managed the Cubs to that wild card title just a year ago, Today was fired by the Chicago Cubs. So he went to uh, went from being the toast of the town to being a bum in just a year. Pete Harnish, it was his victory last night with an arm that is almost surely going to need surgery when this season is over. Last night he got the Reds to this game with a, a great performance. After waiting nearly six hours even to go out there after the game was supposed to have started. 16 wins for Harnett. Right back to Graves again. This time he got the glove on it. And is just in time to get Edgardo Alfonso. One of only two times that they've gotten Alfonso, who's been beating up on the Reds. Five to nothing in the fifth inning. And then Alfonso drove in another run in the sixth inning with an RBI double. Olerud, Piazza, and Ventura. With only one hit between the three of them. One RBI, Ventura getting a base loaded walk. So much of the Mets offense tonight has come from the top two spots in the batting order. Henderson and Alfonso combining for four RBIs. Henderson, by the way, has left the game now. As Melvin Mora, who was yesterday's ninth inning hero, Mora, in place of Ricky Henderson, got the one out single in the ninth inning ahead of Alfonso's base hit that helped set up the winning run that scored on the wild pitch. So Henderson, 40 years of age and uh, perhaps heading to the postseason now again for the first time as a Met. And a lot of smiles in that Mets dugout now. As they six outs away from being able to let all of that emotion overflow. And that's interesting. Well, yesterday when they won the ball game, the Mets had a big, big celebration. 
right out on the field. They just they could not restrain themselves. And I understand that because they had come from two games out with three to go, and that was like they had really accomplished something, which they had. They got themselves one more game here against the Reds tonight, and maybe some more if they can hold on. The batter is Eddie Tomlinson, and as we start thinking more and more about the Mets. Perhaps moving on now. The fact that Ladder has taken them so deep into this game, giving the bullpen up till now a night off, could be a, a very big benefit tomorrow night if they open up the playoffs indeed in Phoenix against the Arizona Diamondbacks. If the Mets are the team that makes it, they open in Arizona. Eddie Tarbinzi, two and one the count. And they had the same type of performance Saturday when Rick Reed pitched nine innings and gave the bullpen a complete rest. So they're getting what they need at the right time. And that helped them win that ball game yesterday. I mean, the bullpen was a little better than Pittsburgh's bullpen yesterday in that win. In fact, uh, Church Wendell was extraordinary. Came in, retired eight in a row. It may have been the, the key performance out of that bullpen. Go so long because he was rested thanks to Rick Reed. That is too low, and Tobinsy gets a leadoff walk. The first time the Reds have had a base runner since the third inning. Leiter had retired 13 consecutive Reds until now. Another field goal for the Dolphins on Monday Night Football, six to three. Miami over the Bills late in the first quarter on ABC. A little staring in the Mets bullpen, but no one is throwing. Leiter had thrown only 97 pitches coming into this inning. Aaron Boone. One ball, no strikes. Now, they have a runner at first base, but have not gotten a runner to second base yet tonight. Such has been the complete dominance of Al Leiter. Boone has popped a short and struck out. That's a strike. The pitcher spot due up next, and Mark Lewis is out on deck. That's a foul. Down the left field line. And it's a ball and two strikes to Aaron Boone. The Mets bullpen is indeed getting to work now, just in case, behind Al Leiter. The right-hander, number 99, Turk Wendell. And the left-hander getting up right alongside him, number 45, John Franco. Who, more than any other Met, is looking forward to a celebration after this game. 15 years of service time in the Major Leagues, more than that actually, has never played in a postseason game. Curveball punched foul off to the right. One ball, two strikes. Franco has had more time in the big leagues among active players without ever playing in the postseason. And of course, Franco grew up in New York. As he said yesterday after the ball game, nobody, fans or otherwise, bleeds Mets blue more than he does. Curveball hits the mound. Ordonez for one, the first. Two. Double play. Well, Leiter gets what he needs. He gets the ground ball, and with this infield of Ordonez, Alfonso, and Ventura, they make all the plays behind him. There's a cut fastball down low, and it hits the mound, which slows the ball up, but I think Ordonez was going to get it anyway, and he makes the throw to first base to complete the double play. The last time the New York Mets made the postseason play, 1988, Mark Lewis, the man who's just now pinch hitting, in that year he graduated from high school here in Cincinnati, Hamilton High School, where he set several national high school batting records. Back with the Reds for a second time. He was with them the last time they made the postseason in 1995 under manager Davey Johnson. Franco, 
all those years without ever making postseason play. The year that Mark Lewis graduated from high school was the closer for the Cincinnati Reds. He began his career right here in Cincinnati. And uh, it would be ever so sweet for him to celebrate the move to the postseason here in Cincinnati after all those years. Lewis is gone. And Al Leiter has a one-hit shutout through eight innings. Olerud, Piazza Ventura coming up. Heading up the steps into the clubhouse, and as he passes the, the champagne, which is on ice. Well, I'll tell you what, John, if they win and they have the champagne, they better be sparing with it. they got to face Randy Johnson tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> you better not go up celebrating too much. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of time to, uh, to celebrate here for the Mets. They're, they'll be right back under the gun tomorrow night against the big unit. Strike one from Dennis Reyes out of the Reds bullpen to John Olerud. Olerud 0 for 3 with a walk. Reyes is the fourth Cincinnati pitcher of this game. There have been five other one-game playoffs in a tiebreaker in Major League history. That's a base hit to center for Olerud. And we're wondering if the performance so far of Al Leiter is the strongest ever seen in a game like this. Coming up tomorrow, it's at this point looking to be the Astros in Atlanta against Greg Maddox and the Braves. Shane Reynolds for Houston at 4 Eastern on ESPN. Rangers Yanks, 8 o'clock Eastern from Yankee Stadium on NBC. And then it appears to be, at this point, the Mets against the big unit, 11 o'clock Eastern on ESPN tomorrow night from Phoenix. But we have to be careful. What is that? Remember Yogi Berra? It ain't over till, till it's, it's over. over. All right. Al Leiter with a one hit shutout through eight innings. I remember Joe uh, you being in that one game playoff Houston and the Dodgers 1980. Joe Necro. Joe Necro was the best pitcher on the field that particular day. He pitched very well. I don't think he pitched the entire ball game though. Piazza the third. Get one there. Reese back to first double play. Piazza grounded into more double plays than any other hitter in the National League this year. And he is 0 for 2 with three walks in this game. And they only pitched to him after they had a commanding lead, which I think was very smart on the Reds Park. You don't pitch to the big guns unless you have to. 1962 Billy Pierce in game one of a best of three playoff series pitched a complete game shutout against the Los Angeles Dodgers at Candlestick Park. 1951 Clem Labine of the Dodgers pitched a shutout against the Giants in game two of that series. Ventura with a base hit and he'll hold as Dimitri Young hustles over to cut that ball off. That's the first hit of the game for Ventura. The ninth hit for the Mets in the game. They've had nine hits plus they've received eight walks. When you have a one game playoff it's like the seventh game of the league championship series. I mean you have to win it to move on and you only have one game in which to do it. Big difference in a two out of three series. Bill's Dolphins exchanging field goals again. On ABC Monday Night Football. Here five to nothing Mets top of the ninth inning. And John we go back to June 6 when the Mets were struggling and they fired three of their coaches and Bobby Valentine's head was supposed to be next. And here he is on the verge of getting his team to the postseason. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for being able to turn this team around when they fire your coaches. And they, they came out of that losing streak on Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN against the Yankees beating Roger Clemens. Pokey Reese just did get there in time to retire Ventura. The Mets are gone. And now the Reds after a great season. Their last chance. The Reds the first professional team in baseball history 1869. This is where it all began. And so far for the Reds even the Duke being invoked wearing a Reds sweatshirt has not been enough. Only one hit against Al Leiter. Stay tuned now, right after the game. Baseball tonight coming up, and 
on baseball tonight. We will take you into the clubhouses for the postgame coverage, the celebration that may be in store for the Mets. Peter Gammons will have his analysis. And Chipper Jones with the playoffs beginning tomorrow. We'll sound off on his MVP type season in the playoffs. And they've got the wild card paraphernalia ready to go. If the Mets can get these final three outs with that five run lead intact. The Reds at least will give it their best shot in the ninth inning. The top of the order. Pokey Reese, Barry Larkin, and Sean Casey. What a year it's been for Pokey Reese. A breakthrough year for Pokey. He had never hit before. Even at the minor league level, he had never had a year such as this. Pokey Reese was a 241 career hitter in the minors. 284 this season. He's established himself as one of the premier defensive players at second. And now a force offensively as well. And John, this is kind of an interesting battle that most other teams in major leagues are watching. The Reds with a small payroll, 33 million, I guess, and the Mets almost double that. And here they are fighting the Mets for the wild card berth. Two and one. And it's off the outside. The Oakland A's were in a similar position. They had a small payroll and made a run at the wild card. Armando Benitez gets up in the Mets bullpen just in case. Three and one the count. Bobby Valentine, he's got many ghosts that could be exorcised here tonight. As is the same for his veteran pitcher, John Franco, who's never been to the, the big postseason party. But Valentine also has some postseason history in his family. He is the son-in-law of Ralph Branca. Ralph Branca, of course, is the man who threw the pitch that was hit by Bobby Thompson. The shot heard around the world to give the New York Giants the National League pennant against the Brooklyn Dodgers in a playoff such as this in 1951. That's a foul right back beneath us. And you can see Bobby Valentine motioning to Benitez down there, hurry up, hurry up. I want you to get ready as quickly as possible. It's funny, Barranco went to the ballpark yesterday, said he wanted to be there because he felt like October 3rd owed his family something. Yeah. And the Mets were able to win. October the 3rd yesterday, the 48th anniversary of the Bobby Thompson home run off Ralph Branca, and it was ironic. Branca was not there at the beginning of the game because he had a long-standing commitment to appear at a card show with Bobby Thompson. That's down the left field line, a base hit. An extra base hit for Pokey Reese. And he is the Reds' first runner to make second base tonight. was three and two so he had to throw a strike he was wasn't trying to spot it or do anything special with it when you have a five run lead you just want to make him put the ball in play and Porky Reese finds the hole down the left field line but Leiter knew what he was doing he was just trying to make sure he threw a strike the Porky Reese fan club they love it I think Al Leiter subscribes to the theory at this point that it takes five solo homers to beat you but only a grand slam and a solo homer to tie so you miss that the guys have to hit their way on base. Barry Larkin. And another strong year with veteran leadership from Barry Larkin. The former National League MVP. And also a native of this area. Born in Cincinnati. Too high. One ball and no strikes. Now 35 years old. But it appears that Benitez is ready. In case Bobby wants to go to him, he is ready in the bullpen. Here's Armando, number 49. Alongside Al Jackson, the bullpen coach. 2 0. Oh. Ricky Henderson now, who has had a heroic night on the big stage. But now, Dave Wallace, the pitching coach, is going to go out. Join Mike Piazza with Al Leiter at the pitcher's mound. 
He had thrown only 111 pitches coming into this inning at Al Leiter. Baseball tonight, right after the game. So don't go anywhere because we'll have the complete story from the clubhouses, both the Mets and Reds clubhouses. Wherever the celebration is, we'll have it on baseball tonight. And also the, the complete look at how the playoff picture shapes up because all of the piece, pieces will be in place at the end of this game for the first time. 2-0 to Barry Larkin. 3-0. The Reds, three, four, five hitters to follow. Casey Vaughn and Dimitri Young. Larkin is 0 for 2 with a walk tonight. Three and one. Well, I think if you're Barry Larkin, you have to take one more, John. You can't hit a five-run homer in this situation. You need base runners. Bokey Reese led off of the double. Ricky Henderson, a spectator at this point, but he swung at it. Right to the shortstop, Ordonez. One away. Reese over to third. And that surprised me because Barry is usually very aware of situations, but I don't think you, at that point you just need base runners. Now Sean Casey has been one of the top hitters in the league all year with Vaughn behind him, but the three, four, five hitters for the Reds tonight have not so much as reached base, not even with a walk. They are 0 for 9. Casey, Vaughn, and Young each 0 for 3. Casey has flied out deep to left, struck out, and grounded out. And this is a guy we'll be hearing a lot more from if he can stay healthy. I mean, he looks like he's got one of the, the sweet strokes. And Jack McKeon thinks he's going to win batting championships. A la Tony Gwynn. And also be a perennial 30 home run man. Well, he's going to have to wait till Larry Walker leads the league because, I mean, at this point, Larry Walker hitting 380, 370. It's not going to be very difficult for anyone to hit that high. Larry Walker hit 379 to lead the National League this year, but he also hit 37 home runs. So he's not your prototypical high batting average hitter in the form of Tony Gwynn, Rod Carew, and all those guys that hit for high averages without hitting a lot of home runs. Two strikes to Sean Casey, runner with third. Just off the outside, he wouldn't chase it. One ball, two strikes. Bobby Valentine, 1,704 games. This is the, the fourth beyond the 1,700 without ever going to the postseason. And that has dogged him, especially these last two years. The Mets, who lost the last five games consecutively last year, to lose their chance to go to postseason. And then they had that seven-game losing streak near the end this year. He is two outs away from taking his Mets to Phoenix. That's a foul. Out of play. Casey stays alive. Two balls, two strikes. Al Leiter has not had a complete game this year. The Mets as a, a, a staff have only pitched four complete games all year. And two of those have come from Kenny Rogers who was not a Met until late July. Leiter has now thrown 128 pitches tonight. He struck him out. His seven strikeout. And again he goes high and out of the strike zone. But I tell you what, the Reds just have to tip their hats to Al Leiter because he's had good stuff and he's used it intelligently. And when your pitcher does that, you do not have a lot of chances. Here's that high fastball right on by him with two strikes. That's a tough pitch to catch up with. Yeah, the despair. And for Bobby Valentine, it's never been this close. One out away. Greg Vaughn, the hitter. And fittingly, Greg Vaughn, the veteran, added to this Reds ball club for leadership and for a lot of RBIs, and he's delivered both. 
You're right. He's been the guy in the clubhouse. That was the best investment the Reds made last winter. And it's one ball and one strike now. The clubhouse is ready. The champagne is on ice. And the the lockers have been protected with the big sheets of plastic. And for the Mets, who've been through three different seasons worth emotionally this year, there's another fan has come running out onto the field to be taken care of by the Cincinnati police. And uh, this is Bobby Valentine, who's ready for a celebration, but. Well, you don't want anything to break your pitcher's rhythm. I mean, Leiter has found his control again. He's throwing well. And you do not want him to have to stand out there on the mound while he take care of the problem. That's uh, three different times we've had people on the field, twice in the middle of an inning here in Cincinnati tonight. The forlorn look of Sean Casey. Bobby Valentine. And the Mets need one out more. Two and one to Greg Vaughn. For Vaughn, personal satisfaction too, Joe, because 50 homers last year in San Diego, but the feeling was, what were the odds that he'd do it again? And they traded it. Well, he's not going to do it again. The 45 is good enough. He's not going to hit 50, but 45, that's a lot of home runs with a lot of RBIs. And he's helped the Cincinnati club to almost as many wins as the Padres had last year. But for the first time since the wild card system has come in, a team will have won as many as 96 games and not made it to the ultimate goal. Barry Larkin, now at 35 years of age, it is becoming evident he's not going to make it this year. But the game moves on. And now Bobby Valentine has to decide how much longer can he stick with his great veteran outlighter who had been so strong tonight he's talking it over with Dave Wallace the pitching coach and his reaction after throwing ball four he's got a two hit shutout going and I'm sure Joe really dearly wants to finish it well the fact that he has a two hit shutout shouldn't come into play here. If you're the manager, you have to say to yourself, can he finish and not worry about whether he gets a complete ball game or pitches a two-hit shutout. The only objective tonight is to win. As Vaughn runs, Dimitri Young fouls one down the right field line. Dimitri Young he is 0 for 3, two ground outs and a pop fly to center. Vaughn was running, they're not holding him at first base. We've got Pokey Reese at third and Vaughn at first. This is the 10th time there's been a tiebreaker playoff in the history of Major League Baseball. And up to now, one of the greatest pitching performances ever seen in one of these. And it's caught by Alfonso at second base. And Al Leiter has completed a two-game, a two-hit shutout. And it has put the Mets into the playoffs for the first time in 11 years. And this one was Leiter's first complete game of the season. And at long last, the real celebration can begin for the New York Mets. And John, we mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast that Leiter has been there before. He started game seven for the Marlins against the Cleveland Indians in 1997. And, they, and the Marlins won that game. And I think tonight again he was just on top of his game. He pitched a great ball game and he was very smart. And again the Reds have nothing to hold their heads down about. They just ran into a buzzsaw tonight. John Franco more than 15 years in the big leagues longer than any other current player without ever being in postseason play. That drought has ended. And he and Leiter. Begin their celebration. The New York Mets, who were dead, it seemed, just three days ago, are only the second team in history to be two out with only three to play and still make it 
into postseason play, joining the San Francisco Giants of 1962. It's the only other one ever to do it. And they could be the second wild card to win the World Series because they have a good ball club. They've got a good defense when they get good pitching and they can score some runs. They're as good as any team in baseball. And a nice play there by Alfonso, and now they can let it all hang out. And fittingly by Alfonso, because he got it all started, driving in the only runs that Leiter would need for the two-run first inning homer. Just past Leiter, but there was Alfonso. That great Mets infield comes through again. And Al Leiter with a, an amazing performance in the biggest game of the year and for Bobby Valentine. They were calling for him to be fired just a week ago in New York. Now his Mets are headed to Phoenix against the big unit tomorrow night. The New York Mets are the wild card champions. Stay tuned now. Baseball tonight coming up next. They'll take you right back to Cincinnati. John Moore and John Miller. Joe Moore. 1,000. <laughs> wow. Thank you, brother. You gave it to me all day. That was Ricky Henderson, huh? Who cares about that stuff? Talk about this team. This is a great team. Who cares about that nonsense that people like to write about? You should write about this team. This is a character, a group of characters who have character. They're the greatest great group of guys anybody could be around. And, hey, Jack McKeon's group was as good, if not uh, even better, than most teams who've ever been in the playoffs. And what a season they had. And uh, just to my coaches and the organization, my players, my friends, my mom and dad, I know you're out there. <laughs> Bobby and, and everyone, this is, just, this is just a start. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Bobby, you've been through so much. The team lost seven straight games. Everybody counted you out. How were you able, as the leader of this group, to get them back on the right track? I took it from them. I just stood back and watched. They knew what they were doing. They told me they had it together. I knew, believed it right from the day, day one. And uh, when they said, just let us make a play or two, and uh, I sat back and watched it, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate it for 97 games so far, and uh, actually for 163, and we'll get over to Arizona see what's going on. Obviously, there is, there is that monkey off your back now. You have finally, you have finally gotten to the postseason, Bobby. Because of this guy, how about the game, Al Leiter? How about Al Leiter? That's what it's all about right there. It's not about getting to my postseason. It's that he wanted it. He wanted it badly. These guys wanted it badly. That's why we're going there. And I'm riding along. All right, Bobby. Let's, let's talk to Al Leiter. Al, we thought we'd have you as an analyst this Thank year God. for baseball tonight. Tell we're about Schneider's to make the I'm call. Happy as heck I'm not going. <laughs> the call and was. Ravi and whoever else is over there, the commissioner. <laughs> Tell me about the effort tonight. I mean, the first inning, you had the two-run lead. You walked the first guy. Yeah, you gave up a couple yeah. of shots. It looked like you might have a rocky outing, no but doubt. then. Well, let's face it. Any game like this, is uh, you, you feel the emotions, and the mind plays a part. And obviously, uh, the first bat of the game, walking him wasn't a good idea. But I settled down a little bit. I got uh, Larkin out and uh, just went with it. But once I settled down, I felt like I was able to change speeds a little bit more. I used my curveball. And then we get up 3 nothing after the third. And a game like this, I could tell some of those guys were pressing. Vaughn swung at a high curveball. And uh, a couple other pitches were normally maybe perhaps they wouldn't have swung at. I got a little lucky on it. Casey Vaughn and uh, Young, they're 3 4 5 guys go 0 for 9. How important was it to get the middle of the order the way you did? Well, it's important any middle of the order, and obviously uh, I knew what Vaughn was doing of late, and uh, all of them, really. Casey Tobbins, he's been tough. So uh, I think what I did was uh, I sat with Mike before the game, and I said of all the guys, I'm a little more careful with Vaughn. Uh, he was the one guy you couldn't let beat you. Yeah, absolutely. I, nothing against Dimitri, but, I, you know, you just feel like if I if I let Vaughn get away, uh, you know, I have Dimitri, and then I think Hammond down the line. Uh, but uh, it's a great team, and it's a real shame uh, that a team with 96 wins has to go home and it, it says a lot about that ball club and uh, they had a heck of a year. How much did the Reds help you by swinging at some bad pitches? A lot. Uh, you know, especially once I established a strike in, in, in the uh, in a count early on and then they swing at a bad pitch. It just enables me to relax and loosen up a little bit. Well, Randy Johnson's next. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll be real loose on that ride to uh, Phoenix and uh, let's have fun with this. This is fun. All right, Al. Okay. Boy, we're going to miss him as an analyst <laughs> for baseball tonight. I'm telling you, he was good. Mike Piazza on this side of me. Come on this side. We got Mike Piazza, the catcher of the New York Mets. And, Mike, you've been here before with the Dodgers in two situations, once against the Reds, once against the Braves. And in both cases, the team was swept.
how badly do you want to turn this thing around for yourself as you look ahead to Arizona? Well, I mean, not just for myself, but for this ball club. I mean, you know, a week ago, it's funny, you know, you're reading all, all the papers in New York, and they all had us buried, and, you know, there was no miracles left. And, and obviously, we were very down, and we had a tough streak, but we hung in there. So now, I think our attitude now, everything from here on out is icing on the cake. So we got to play a tough Arizona club tomorrow. Hopefully, we just keep it rolling. You know, we don't want to stop to think about it too much right now. Just enjoy this for the moment right now. Al Leiter did not complete a game all year long, Mike. How was he able to summon it up in game 163? I can't explain. I, you know, I think he was obviously just early on as we all were and I think Fonzie came out hit the big home run kind of took the pressure off and you know he was getting ahead of guys and he was throwing strikes and, uh, kill me, kill me. <laughs> and we SPM picks up the dry cleaning on this one but uh, you know he just threw a great game we were very happy we just had some very good team offense and you know the last week we've been getting back to the things that were successful for us the whole second half and uh, you know that's just something I, I hope we can continue that's all how much does this mean to Bobby Valentine? Needless to say, he's been reminded of it. 1,704 <laughs> games without a postseason appearance. I mean, you know, Bobby's just one of those guys. I, I really at times feel sorry for him because he really, uh, he wants so bad to win. And sometimes, uh, you know, his emotions kind of take over and he just obviously goes crazy and it may rub people the wrong way. But deep down inside, he just wants to win. And, uh, you know, obviously it's a big monkey off his back as well. And um, so, again, like I said, we, we don't have much time to enjoy it, but we're going to enjoy it tonight and, and hopefully come out swinging tomorrow. How do you feel physically after 163 Beat games? Beat up. I mean, you know, I think the, the toughest thing about it is we kind of put ourselves in this position, you know, when we, we had that streak and every game is so critical. Ideally, you'd like to have, you know, four or five days before you start the playoffs to get in there. But you know what? Now, like I said, the attitude is such that we, we just weren't expected to be here. So now everything from here on out is just, I mean, we have that attitude like, you know, we got nothing to lose. I mean, it may not be the case because there was a lot of expectations on this ball club, but, you know, that's the way we feel. And uh, before the last week, we just said, you know what, let's just have a good weekend, finish strong and, and kind of just get that that sort of karma or that, that idea that we didn't finish strong last year off our backs. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Mike Piazza. Ricky Henderson is now going to be joining us, the left fielder of the New York Mets. Ricky, the bat speed's still there after all these years. The bat speed's still there, you know. Uh, it was just a great game for us today, you know. The biggest thing for us to do is probably just come out there and get a few runs early for Al and let him relax and uh, he pitched an outstanding ball game for us. You've been with great teams throughout your career. You've been to the World Series. Does this team that you're on now have the same qualities and characteristics that can let them go deep into the playoffs? I think it, this team uh, have the quality to go out there and, and put us in a, a great position during the playoffs. So we just got to keep our head up and go out there and play nine hard in each and every day and, and we got a good chance of winning. The Cincinnati Reds seemed to be a team that was flat this game. I mean, this team had played so well all year, and they just swung at bad pitches. They really helped Al Leiter a lot tonight. What do you think happened with Cincinnati? I don't know. You know, they came in late. They had a late game yesterday, and they came in late. And the biggest thing, you know, they was up for the game. But, you know, Al was throwing a good ball game. We got some runs. A lot of times when you put some runs on the board early, you know, it, it make them look flat. And Al was throwing a great ball game. All right, Ricky Henderson with the home run. Thank Moving you. on to face Randy Johnson. There you go. Thank you. All right. Edgar Alfonso was the hitting star of the game, certainly for the New York Mets. He actually got the game-winning hit early in the first inning. He was the second batter of the ball game, and then produced another RBI double later in the ball game in the fifth in his third at bat. Let's go back to the studios. We'll have Edgar Alfonso coming next from a very ebullient Mets clubhouse. I'm Mark Schwartz. All right, Mark, thank you very much. I mean, Connecticut is beautiful in the fall, but Al has chosen Arizona, and we can't blame him, and we're very happy for Al Leiter and the rest of the Mets. And uh, John Franco gets into the postseason for the first time, which is huge. We'll hear from Edgardo Alfonso, also Robin Ventura. But what Al Leiter did for this team, for this organization tonight, how do you measure that? Well, absolutely. I mean, this is a team that hasn't won a postseason game since 1988. And, you know, just to get back there with this Huge game, but the, the way he did it, he had such command. He used both sides of the plate. They're talking about guys swinging at bad pitches, but when Al Leiter can, can throw his, his changeup, his curveball for strikes, he uses both sides of the plate. He's got such a great fastball. He sets up a lot. What he also did, though, was he took all the pressure off the right. bullpen. Everyone got the day off, and that's really important. They've pitched a lot this last weekend to get them into this postseason. Now they've had the time off to go face Arizona. I tell you, the Mets have been to Antarctica and back. 
There's nothing more anybody can say about them. They've, they've really gone past the point of pressure. They're a veteran team. Their pitching is perfectly set up with Yoshi and Rogers and Reed before Leiter comes back on Saturday. They're very dangerous, and I'm sure Arizona is fully aware of that. Absolutely. Okay, let's take a look at the matchups now that they're all set. And again, the eight teams that are going to be in the 1999 postseason are now know where they're going to play. In the National League, it looks this way. Astros, they go with Shane Reynolds to deal with Greg Maddox. Maddox, 9-8, 3.05 ERA in the postseason. And the Mets are going to send Masato Yoshi to the mound to deal with Randy Johnson. Yoshi has got the second best ERA in the National League since August 15th. That's 161. And as Peter just pointed out, we know all about how strong this is.